they can't hear um, any. Good morning, everybody. Welcome along to this morning's BCP Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Dave Kelsey, and I'm chairing the meeting this morning. I will firstly pass over to the Democratic Services Officer, Mr. Tyler, who will read out the housekeeping rules. Mr. Tyler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please note that this meeting of the Planning Committee is being recorded by the Council for live and subsequent broadcast and will be published on the Council website for a minimum of six months. For members of the public that are making a representation to the committee, the cameras will capture your image. By your presence, you are deemed to consent to be filmed and to the use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. The meeting may also be recorded or live streamed for live or subsequent broadcast by members of the public, although ultimate discretion in this matter lies with the chairman in case of disruption. Please could everyone present follow these ground rules. Only speak when invited to by the chairman. Please use the microphones on your desk when speaking and please remember to turn them off when you are finished. If accessing the uh, meeting via Microsoft Teams, please turn on your video function when invited to speak. If you would like to speak, please just raise your hand to alert the chairman. When voting on a move, the chairman will call out each committee member's name in roll call style and will ask the member to respond with a vote for, against or abstain. For those of us in the room, please note that if the fire alarm sounds, please exit the building by way of the nearest available signed fire exit route and make your way to the assembly point along Bradley Road under the flyover. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and that mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. That's really important not to interfere with the live stream and the audios in the room. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. So I'll introduce the committee members to everyone in the room this morning. Uh, we have myself, Councillor Dave Kelsey. We have Councillor Johnson, the Vice Chairman. We have Councillor Steve Barron, Derek Borthwick, David Brown, Malcolm Davies, Peter Hall, Paul Hilliard, Tony O'Neill, Marion Lepedevin, and Felicity Rice. We also have a selection of officers that are with us this morning, including Artemis Christoffi, who is the development manager. We have Robert Firth, who is a senior solicitor, and Mr. Tyler, who is democratic officer. We also have several other officers here this morning that may partake as and when required to do so. Additional attendees, as I say, may be called upon. We will move to the agenda now. Firstly, Item one, apologies. Do we have any apologies, please, Mr. Tyler? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have received apologies from councillors Simon McCormack, Robert Lawton, George Farquhar, Simon Ball, and Tony Trent. And subsequently with item two, substitute members, we have with us councillor David Brown substituting for councillor Tony Trent. Thank you, members. Do we have any declarations of interest on this morning's meeting, please? Councillor Barron. Thank you, Chairman. As I've said before, we're councillors and we're all in the local community, uh, so I'm going to be absolutely thorough here to cover everything I possibly can. So I have local interest as a resident um, at one time or another. This is item A. Uh, at one time or another, I've used all three hotels. Um, also, people who live next door to the Sandbox Hotel are known to me, but they haven't approached me on this item. And also, the applicant's offices are within my ward, and they also haven't approached me on this item. Uh, so I feel uncomfortable to sit on, on, on item A. Item B, uh, in my role as lead member for the regeneration of Paul, this is a, a different situation to the Thistle application. I've been in discussions with the applicants and I've been to presentations, so I feel it wouldn't be appropriate for me to sit on item B, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Barron. That is noted. Members, do you agree for me signing the minutes of previous meetings? Thank you. So we have a schedule of planning applications, but before we do that, I've had a request from the interim director of planning who would like to have, make a short speech in referral to item B on the agenda today with the proposal to withdraw that item from the agenda. I would ask Mr. Smith if he would explain why. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Smith, didn't mean that. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, just for those of you who, who don't know me, I'm not Mr. Smith. No. I'm, I'm Sam Fox. I'm the interim director of, of planning for, for BCP Council. I came in very recently into the role last week. Um, so I'm requesting that the planning committee withdraw item 6B, which is application APP 180750F, for land between the bridges at West Key Road 
pulled from today's agenda. So if members vote to agree this, the item will be brought back to the planning committee for consideration at a future meeting. The scheme has been in for four years. It's attracted substantial public interest, over 1,200 representations, and there are outstanding issues relating to two statutory consultees, the Environment Agency and Historic England, that it's important for officers to review with those agencies prior to committee considering the application. I must stress that the applicant has requested the application is not withdrawn from today's agenda, but I'm still putting this forward as a, as a request. Whilst it is regrettable that I'm recommending withdrawal of the item at this late stage, it is not a recommendation I make lightly, and it's important that we clarify these issues regarding flood risk and scale massing and visual impact with these statutory agencies, given the prominent nature of the site in the pool regeneration area and the volume of public interest in the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Fox. Members, are there any questions that you would like to ask of Mr Fox before I will propose that we do uh, withdraw this item today? Councillor Barron. Is it appropriate for me to vote on what you're going to propose? I'm sorry, Councillor Barron. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll keep my hands down. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Yeah, an idea about how long the deferment would be, you know. <laughs> Uh, just to get an idea about how long the deferment, how long the. I'm, I'm sorry, but we do have a slight problem with the noise in here. The fact that we have all the windows and everything. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I think it's probably because I'm facing you and I've got a big mouth. Um, sorry about that. We will try and speak as loudly as we can to make sure that everyone hears. So members, if we could all do that, just try and speak closely into your microphones as we can to make it helpful. Just, just to get an indication of how long the deferment may be, you know, are we talking into the next planning committee meeting? Or are we talking several months away? Thank you. It's a good question. Um, it depends on how quickly we can sit down with those uh, agencies. And uh, as a matter of courtesy, I'd like to sit down with the applicants as well. I'm hoping we can do that very quickly. Um, I would suggest we'd probably be looking to bring the item back uh, at some stage, probably uh, the later September meeting, just being realistic. Any other questions from members? No? In that case, I will move that we do withdraw this item from today's agenda. Do I have a second of that move, please? Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. Second. Going to the vote. All those in agreement, please show. That's 10 votes for the Chairman. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Therefore, item B is withdrawn. Um, just before we move on to item A, um, an apology from myself for the room that we are in today. I appreciate it's hot in here. It's not the most congenial room to hold a meeting in, but as you're aware, we are transforming between buildings and everything is being changed at the moment. Democratic services have gone out to try and arrange some bottles of water for members of the public. So hopefully in the next few minutes, we'll get some water in so you can all at least have a drink and be slightly refreshed. I'd like to hold this meeting in a very kind and gentle manner today please what i will ask is that there is no barracking no talking when someone else is talking it's difficult enough to hear and hear it as it is so if when any other person is speaking please can i ask you all to remain quiet uh, mobile phones please switch to silent that way hopefully everyone will hear what's going on and we will be able to get through the meeting in a happy and congenial way so we will move on now to item 6A, which is the Haven Hotel, the bank on 161 Banks Road, 159 Banks Road, the Sandbanks Hotel at 15 Banks Road, and the Harbour Heights Hotel at 73 Haven Road Pool. And I would ask if Claire McCarthy would be prepared to present her case, please. Claire, are you there? Right. I am here. I'm I'm just trying to share the screen now. So I will just check. OK, so I have now shared my screen and I hope you can all see the first slide and it would confirmation that you can hear me would be helpful. I've turned my we, volume to 100 percent, so I hope you can. Yeah, we can see the slides and we can hear you. If I could just ask you to speak as loudly as you can, Claire, to enable everyone to be able to hear. Thank you. 
Okay, I will do. So um, this application involves three sites, the Harbour Heights Hotel, the Sandbanks Hotel and the Haven Hotel. It's a major outline application with landscaping reserved. All other matters are for consideration, just landscaping reserved. The Harbour Heights Hotel um, is the first of the hotels. Um, it's, uh, the proposal is to erect a 38 suite apart hotel. For those who are not familiar with that, that is um, where you have an apartment of your own which contains a kitchenette, bedroom, uh, bathrooms, and um, you, some of them are one bedroom and some of them are proposed as two bedroom, very much like you get in the European hotels if you take an apartment. And um, this is what is trying to be modelled out in this proposal. Sandbanks Hotel proposal to erect a 171 bedroom hotel with hotel, with hotel facilities, access and underground parking. The 171 bedrooms at the moment, just so members are aware, the Sandbanks Hotel at the moment has 77 bedrooms. The hotel is proposed to be significantly expanded, um, more than doubling ex existing rooms uh, to accommodate the majority of the rooms from the Haven Hotel um, currently, which I will go on to later. So the Haven Hotel is proposed to be to, to on the site to erect three blocks of residential apartments totaling 119 units. There will be a public restaurant, access and underground parking. There will also be a gym, but you'll hear later on that the gym will need to remain um, for residents only. So, as you can see from the description, there are three sites. They are outlined in red on the slide. You can now see the Harbour Heights up here, pool, uh, the Sandbanks Hotel here and the Haven Hotel here. They all lie within the vicinity of the Sandbanks Peninsula. And the three sites are owned by applicant uh, FJB Hotels by FJP Hotels and the aim is to um, follow policy PP23 of your local plan to try and uh, in, in order to upgrade and replace, well completely redevelop all three sites, um, they have sought to accommodate almost the same number of hotel numbers um, all together within the Harbour Heights and the Sandbanks Hotel uh, by cross subsidising that redevelopment um, with loss of the Haven Hotel as a hotel and its redevelopment with the 119 flats. Now, um, it's important that I explain the policy PP23 to, to everyone because um, this is the relevant local plan policy for tourist accommodation and existing tourist accommodation um, proposals resulting in the loss of tourist accommodation in the case of B&Bs and guest houses with 10 or more bedrooms which each of these hotels has a lot more than 10 will only be permitted where it can be adequately demonstrated that the loss is necessary to enable investment in the remaining tourist accommodation on site or elsewhere in pool. And at this stage, um, obviously, uh, members will be aware there has been a, uh, a huge public uh, response about the loss of the Haven Hotel as a hotel in consultee responses, uh, in, in responses um, from neighbours and local residents and community groups. So it's important that it is understood how it can be treated as one application and um, and how it can be tied into to this policy. So um, as a council, we have reviewed 
the concept of having three applications linked through this cross subsidy and we have um, it, it has been accepted that in this situation where the sites are interdependent and one facilitates another that this is um, quite acceptable to have three separate sites in one application and it conforms with the general procedure development order. So um, coming on to how we've tried to assess if a loss is necessary to enable investment in the remaining tourism on site, we, um, the applicant submitted viability testing. They have actually done several rounds of viability testing, which has taken a number of years and a lot of options considered. And in the process of this, um, the viability testing has showed that cross subsidy from redevelopment of the Haven Hotel with flats was the only option out of these three sites which could enable development um, and enable investment of two replacement hotels with almost the same room accommodation overall. There's 22 bedrooms less out of the 209 um, bedrooms. There's two, yeah. So. Um, so that's the uh, principle looking at it all together. I'm now going to run through each site separately and run through the physical factors, the environmental factors about those, and we'll be coming back to this element later. So the local plan designations, the other designations that are relevant, you can see here. Obviously, we have to be mindful of the uh, Pool Harbour, the European and internationally important sites and the impacts on the setting of the Dorset AOMB and Studland Heathland um, as well. And we have a conservation area at uh, the Sandbanks Peninsula headland here, but the site, the nearest site at the Haven Hotel here is over 300 metres away and is not um, affecting the setting of that conservation area in, in terms of um, how we have viewed this application. And the Sandbanks Hotel and the Harbour Heights Hotel, none of the buildings are listed, none of the buildings are in conservation areas or adjoining conservation areas. The Sandbanks beach line policy very much tries to protect the character of the beach itself and um, so that that is of relevance and also the protection of the coastal shoreline character, the sand dunes and so on, um, site of nature conservation interest. The open space and allotments is around the uh, general car park area that everyone will be familiar with, but none of these um, designations directly uh, affect each of these sites other than the uh, European designation. So um, all three sites lie on main roads, the Haven Road, the Banks Road um, and Shore Road. Um, and the, the main roads, which you can see the main roads in yellow. Um, so we've got the Haven Hotel here and the Sandbanks Hotel just at the junction here. And, and then and we've got um, Haven Road here going up. So um, the, the sites are sustainable. They're not sustainable transport corridors for housing provision, but they are sustainable um, transport corridors and um, suitable for tourism uses um, and given that they are main roads and have bus services that is taken into consideration which makes um, along with other factors which makes it acceptable for residential use uh, at um, Banks Road uh, for the Haven Hotel site. So starting from where we came from we've been on a five-year journey with this application and I think it's important that members understand what we've been doing in that time and and where we started and where we've got to. So um, the pre-application um, proposals are sketched out on this slide and you can see the concept model for the Haven Hotel at that time was 14 storeys high and you can see the relationship with Golden Gates, the four storey high uh, building next to it. And um, 
obviously um, from uh, pre-app discussions, the uh, huge issue that was discussed and reduced in stages over the years, ending up at six storeys high for each block. The Sandbanks Hotel, the original application came in in a similar form to that now proposed, but was eight storeys high and did dominate over the adjoining uh, developments. The Harbour Heights, again, uh, here you can see the concept model of it and how that would sit in the landscape and the landscape would not have been able to dominate uh, and the sylvan setting that is there now. So that was again significantly reduced. So coming first of all to the Harbour Heights Hotel, um, this is an aerial view and you can see the front elevation here of the four story block at the front. And then obviously the, uh, we'll see the back later where it drops down and you can see, um, you can see here the terracing and the steps down into the garden area. So the Harbour Heights Hotel is located on Haven Road, just next to the St. Anne's Hospital and um, it's um, in flood zone one. This map shows you where the present day flood zones are. And this site was considered suitable uh, for potentially for housing over and above the Haven site. So at one stage, uh, we looked through viability testing to see if it would be possible for this site um, to be proposed as the flat in a residential area generally and out of the flood zone. However, only 50 flats could be provided in that um, on, on that site, being a smaller site, and it would not have been viable for that to be the alternative use of the three sites proposed. The sandbanks, we didn't look at the alternative site because obviously that is on the beach front and it's a beach site for the best site for a hotel. And so that was that was why the Harbour Heights was considered as the alternative. But it left us considering the application as submitted. So the Harbour Heights, the site of site plan there of how it sits on the site the aerial view of it and the relationship with conning towers adjacent and neighbouring properties generally. All of the neighbouring properties tend to be focused out towards the harbour and views. It's a very elevated position. Um, and this site plan here in the red dotted line, you can see the existing footprint and the outbuildings associated with the existing harbour heights. And you can see in this cross hatched area the um, proposed future terracing. The existing terracing is in this area here. Um, and you can see the general shape of the, the building in, um, that, that is now proposed, but it's it's easier to see it in the, in the elevations and the forthcoming slides. But you've got a, a curvy linear design appropriate for a maritime location um, and you have um, you can see that it has been staggered the bottom level the the line is here and then it gradually steps up in stages and steps in from the boundaries in stages uh, to a much smaller almost penthouse style uh, roof and on the top floor is proposed to be a conference facility with restaurant facilities and an outdoor terrace, which really does overlook taking panoram panoramic views. And that would be open to the public. Um, so this um, uh, CGI computer generated image here of the uh, Harbour Heights Hotel, a part hotel as replaced, shows you how that would sit and it's step back and the sedum roofs to uh, complement and sit comfortably in the uh, sylvan landscape around it. We saw on site yesterday members the, the height of these trees and um, the tree cover will still be sufficient to prevent any overlooking, loss of amenity uh, to neighbouring properties and also to enable the um, the views to be had over this uh, the, the harbour and Brown Sea Island. The detail of the proposal is um, it will have an underground car park, 
and then um, the black areas shown are to be handmade brick linear black areas on the elevations. You can see in each of the elevation drawings um, that the elevations appear very flat, but the building, as you can see, in is curved and that's what happens with the elevations, but you can also see the dotted line of its relationship and height with the existing building and can see that the height is is not significantly higher than the existing Arbor Heights Hotel and the same here. You have got this extra element here and you can see this is the rooftop conference and the sitting area. So again, we have the rear view of that uh, the the building and uh, you can see how the terraces look out um, there are no windows on the side elevation of conning towers in this location so the um, and the amended plans have reduced the terraced areas much further back to try and create uh, less of a, a any dominating impact of it but as you can see this property is fully focused out this way uh, over gaining the um, views of the harbour itself um, these properties down here just to update you this one remains but there has been redevelopment so some of the cgis are you know over lockdown um, the, the development has taken place and you'll see that in the photographs later so this is the southwest elevation of it, um, face it, the rear elevation, which you can see here is so curved in and out, and, and but that's what it looks like in when it's flattened out and the terrace. The CGI of the front elevation, um, this is, is very helpful, showing you the, the levelling dropping down on uh, Haven Road and Conning Towers and its relationship uh, already below, uh, just to alert members to the fact that um, the the Purbeck stone that was shown here has now been replaced with the black linear clay um, brick. So views from the Harbour Heights, this view I uh, took from the um, top floor bedroom at the moment and you can see uh, you can see down at some side windows further down at Conning Towers, but they're not right up where the rest, where where the hotel will will be or or is currently, and just the views that you obtain from and the tree screens as well. And here you can see the uh, replacement new uh, some new buildings that have gone in at the bottom of the terraced area, uh, not part of the hotel. So that's a, a side view of Conning Towers. So this bit is close up against the hotel and was set back to not dominate. But this bit is behind a, a very high hedge, which is to be retained. Those windows cannot be seen from the site, but from higher up they can. But we are well over 20 metres away um, at that point from any overlooking. This is where you can see the um, drop in levels at the rear of the site and the terrace. This is where you can look up as you're walking up Chaddesley Glen, up the little footpath off Banks Road, and you come up and that's how it sits amongst the trees from there. And this is a, a bird's eye view um, showing, um, showing how the terracing is existing and the, the other flats and buildings. So moving on to the Sandbanks Hotel site, this is where the site is. Everyone is familiar with its location, I am sure. The development here has now finished and, and we will see photographs of that later, the ACE building and the other newer building of the Mirage building with its underground car parking um, there off Shore Road. So, there is an issue uh, with flood risk at the Sandbanks Hotel uh, currently and, and ongoing. Uh, so this is very important that it be addressed if a redeveloped hotel is to be provided for a lifetime of at least 60 years. Uh, so um, the Environment Agency present day flood risk shows the Haven Hotel lies within here and it's quite long drawn out. Um, 
and it shows that parts of it flood uh, at the moment and, and not all of it and that is still going to be the case future flood zone 2133 again you can see this part will not be flooding um, because the flooding will come in off the sea down shore road and uh, flood straight down in a channel there um, and there'll be incoming flooding with flood zone two and three in this part of the hotel and its front entrance and the entrance of the underground car park. So that is a matter that really does need to be satisfied if development is to be approved. And you'll hear more about that later. So coming on to the details of the hotel, you can see um, a bird's eye view here. And uh, the hotel consists of 1920s buildings, uh, of 1960s buildings, the mansard roof and 1970s buildings. You can see the completed finished uh, ACE building that's that's gone up here and the Mirage buildings here, which are relatively new. This shares the same curvilinear design at the front as the proposal here. Uh, and at the back, it has a, a squared off um, rectangular impact that you'll see. So this is the uh, Sandbanks Hotel. You can see the car parking is all surface car parking at present. So there's a lot of urban tarmac um, not a lot of landscaping. So landscaping is reserved for the scheme we've got, uh, but there is potential for a, a lot more landscaping on the site, which will be of great benefit um, given the underground car parking if the issues of flooding can be resolved. And the view, again, you can see the older part there, 60s and 70s parts added. Uh, there is an existing permissive footpath that runs through the Sandbanks Hotel site from the Banks or Shore Road, this beginning of Banks Road here, um, and um, going down this footpath, straight line against the hedge and out through this gate by Jazz's Cafe um, and giving access to the beach. There have been issues with a permissive path about the gate being locked at times and so on. Part of this proposal is to make a public right of way, which your public rights of way officer is uh, very pleased to see and fully supportive of. Um, and it will actually run along um, it because of the landscaping. I'll show you the plan later, but it will just curve more and come out just before the existing uh, gate here in the same area near Jazz's Cafe in on, on Shore Road. And that is seen as a, a good benefit to the scheme to, to bear in mind. Sandbanks Hotel itself, the layout, you can see in layout form, very curved, um, really reflecting the beach location, the waves, the nautical design. Um, when you look at the elevations, remember they'll look flat in elevation, but this is what you'll be comparing it with. There is a first floor link to this building at the front, which is a uh, um, public area and here too um, is a public area. We've got um, all of the ground floor and then going up we've got um, hotel accommodation. So looking at the um, the hotel from the front on this section drawing you can see the front uh, that that's one that is connected at first floor at the front projecting forward here and that is represented by this building on the CGI here and these sections are represented by these curved uh, sections going out both sides as you can see here. Um, one of the final amendments to the scheme was to reduce where this red dotted line is. The initial sixth floor plan in 2020 had had this and was reduced later on in 2020 to have it more like a penthouse and bring it in and reduce the scale and impact. And it is considered that that scale and impact of development alongside neighbouring development is acceptable in this location. So um, you can see the models here on the side showing the curves again because 
this is what uh, you see in elevational form on the rear, and this is what you would actually see on the rear with the curves. But this slide is here to show you that the seawall, the uh, flood defence, would be uh, proposed to be Purbeck stone as part of this proposal at the moment, and it would have four metre high. Um, it would be raised to four metres high. It's currently about 2.2, 2.4. Um, and it would be raised to four metres in high, which would come up higher. And then the um, waving pack glass, you can just see a thin line here, hopefully, just before the top of the windows and where the parasols are here. And this is what uh, it would look like from the rear. And this is the rear of the new, the finished um, new building next door. So some other Sandbanks Hotel as existing, you can see the new next door finished building there. Along the terrace here, there's a, a sand play area. Here is the, the wall against the beach that's just over two metres high, and that would be raising to about four metres with the proposals from the applicant at present. Uh, you can see it up close there and from on top here looking down. So moving now to the Haven Hotel, um, again, members will be very familiar with this site right by the Sandbanks Ferry uh, to Studland. Um, this car park here is quite elevated above the height of um, the, uh, the land here and the flood defences here. So there is a ladder down, which I'll show you later for, for the public to access. But one of the big benefits proposed from this scheme is um, if the flood defences can be approved and accepted at the height that is proposed, then there would be a, a footpath, public footpath from the ferry terminal here, and it could go through instead of the ladder and walking along stones and concrete to get to the beach over here, it would run access, fully accessible with a gradient of, of less than 15 degrees and it would be a one in 15. It would go to um, right the way along here and out onto the beach. So flooding at the Haven Hotel um, is as you can see here at the moment, uh, the present day, the flooding is restricted to the area at the front of, uh, well, facing the sea and and the opening of the harbour here. And um, this is flood zone two and three, and the majority of the site lies within flood zone one. However, the future flood risk um, 2133 shows where flood zone two and three will be then. And this is what is uh, causing a big problem with the Environment Agency wanting to be satisfied that could be appropriate. But before we get as far as that, that the modelling and the sensitivity testing of how to keep uh, flats, which are more vulnerable use um, on this, the most vulnerable use on this site, how they would be kept from being flooding, uh, flooded. So looking at the layout of the this site proposed, you have uh, where the uh, in red dotted line here, you can see the existing Haven Hotel Business Centre. That would be replaced with Block A, which is a four storey block of flats. And they would be sat behind the um, parade of shops, cafe, public toilets here. They would actually be further away from them than the current business building marginally. And again, we have a curved design, which you'll see in the elevations. Um, the block C at the front here would sit alongside Golden Gates, um, which is the four storey block you, you've seen earlier and we'll see again. And that would be six storeys high, uh, but being flat roofed, um, it's projecting only slightly above the general tree cover in the area by uh, the, at, and slightly higher by 1.8 metres than the highest point of the Haven Hotel as exists currently. Uh, block B here 
is uh, again a very curved design and it accommodates the restaurant for the public and a gym which would be for residents only if granted and if limited by condition. Um, so moving on to the elevations, block A elevations, you can see the relationship, they're virtually the same as the two-storey business centre with its high roof, which goes to here and the four storeys would fit in there. Um, you can see that um, on the slide at the bottom, the location, Golden Gates lie in front of it and the back end of Golden Gates and then the parade of shops here. So looking from the AOMB and from um, anywhere locally um, other than opposite the site, it would not be seen from, from the sea. Um, it's also in flood zone one. So block A would be okay to be developed um, without flood risk. That's what block A would look like. You can see the parade of shops and the toilets here. You can see the back of Golden Gates flats there. The overlooking issues could all be resolved um, through screening, but the distances are comfortable enough and um, there is no concern over loss of amenity in relationship between the two blocks of Golden Gates and this block. So now looking at some floor spaces, um, I've um, shown a sample of block C here um, because um, it shows you a one bedroom flat and the size of it and a two bedroom flat and the size of it. We've got a mix of flats. We've got three one bed um, in block A, 17 two bed, two three bed, and you can see block B, 60 floor flats. This one has got three one bed, 52 bed, and 11 three bed, and block C, which is this block, two one bed, 29 two bed, and two three bed. Uh, so generally they're, they're two bedroom flats and there's just a few of the others. Um, you can see um, on block B, the swimming pool gym area, you can see a restaurant area here, um, and these actually lie in the in the flood zone two and three in the 2033 one, uh, but they're less vulnerable uses there. But we have all of these flats which also lie within, uh, not not right at the very back. We start getting to uh, flood zone one about here, but these flats would currently be lying within flood zone three. Uh, and so would the flats uh, on the ground floor at Block C. So looking at Block B next, um, you can see the curved design here and the use of uh, the grey linear brick that you had up at the Harbour Heights on, uh, on that block. And you can see the different elevations of it, which are um, curved, as I've shown you on the layout plan and they say the height the top floor again has been reduced on both sides the stepping in to reduce bulk and impact so it's literally this top part of the sixth floor which uh, potential to extend above treetops and does extend above the existing ones immediately nearby uh, the the brick finish for block C is Purbeck Stone at the request of the Dorset AOMB and uh, Natural England, uh, both looking for uh, something that reflects the landscape of the natural environment. And that was amended and changed into that format and um, is now acceptable to them. Um, the elevations. Um, look very flat but again I've put this here to show you that this block is very curved it has balconies it has fabulous views in two directions and therefore significant balconies in those directions <laughs> over towards Studland and over the sea towards Bournemouth and the Isle of Wight. Um, so if this is a, a, a CGI showing you how this, how they actually sit for block B, which is this one with the grey brick and the Purbeck stone of block C facing out that way to Studland and that way towards um, Bournemouth. And um, you can see the 
the potential for landscaping through here um, because of the underground car parking. And you can see that the top floors are very much uh, subordinate to the, the, the uh, as they stagger through. So some wider distance views now. So looking at blocks B and C, you can see the Purbeck stone here and the gray finish here. You can see the trees that are along the um, frontage of properties that uh, extend on Banks Road. And you can see some of the trees in the vicinity here and Panorama Road trees as well, um, which reach heights to almost this height, but we're, we're just low by about six foot, uh, 1.8 meters. You can see the, the overlapping of the two materials, the glazing, and um, in design terms, these flats are uh, these are considered to be of good design, and um, they are all of a size which exceed the space standards. They are luxury flats. They um, they um, have been are of a very sustainable design, uh, construction design inside. They have air source heat pumps and ground source heat pump and um, there are lots of energy benefits and reduction in carbon ratings through the design which is referenced in that section of my report um, and the same applies to the design of the other two hotels in terms of sustainable construction as well. Uh, they exceed the 10% council policy uh, considerably more than double in many aspects. So this is the Golden Gates and you can see the the relationship there. Now in order to try and um, reduce the impact of this sixth story on um, views into the Dorset AOMB well from the Dorset AOMB and and the impact on the headland itself um, I'll come on to um, some slides that um, show that what we have done is we've negotiated with Dorset AOMB who had originally objected to this extra height here and here and um, also um, Lansk, your urban design officers as well and negotiated with um, Dorset AOMB and Natural England with Natural England's landscape officers to secure a compensatory tree planting, £100,000 to be allocated to a fund to be spent immediately in the next few years on the headland at Sandbanks to boost the, um, the, the trees here, as you can see, are reaching maturity. They're not fully mature, but in the next 20 years, nearly all the trees at Sandbanks Headland will be reaching the end of their life. And this um, proposal to grow up through um, with new tree planting, there'll be a fund where anyone that residents can apply and have a tree, uh, a pine tree planted in their garden. Um, it can be used in the Sandbanks, uh, the, the area that BCP have for recreation and and um, car parking, it can be used um, anywhere within the headland and the, the fund will be available. Um, you can see this tallest tree here at 159 Banks Road and that's a two-storey property. Initially this was in the application, um, this, initially this was part of the application when they were those 14-storey elements and it spread into this site but that was removed and now this property will remain there. It's in the ownership of FJB Hotels um, but it will remain there and this hedge and tree screening will be fully retained and that will make a significant impact on screening the height from approaching uh, along Banks Road. So the landscape impacts to be mitigated, we had a landscape visual impact assessment undertaken and you can see from the heathland um, how the buildings along from Bournemouth right through to the uh, sandbanks are um, very close 
and the setting needs to be respectful of the Dorset AOMB and the and Heathland. So um, the closeness you can see here, um, as we all know, and and that's uh, buildings would seem from the sea. But when you look from the beach here, you can see how much screening these these trees um, adjoining the site would provide. So some of the angles from the beach you, you wouldn't see it, and some of them. Uh, and from Banks Road, you wouldn't see it, uh, the extra height. Um, and it really is a matter of um, long distance views mainly. Um, so flood, uh, flood defences is um, a huge concern at the Haven Hotel. And I've explained about this foot, footpath coming across here. And this is the existing height. I've taken some photographs and used some photographs that have been provided to show this relationship with the rocks and the sea here and the wall. Um, and again, uh, the line of the defences here. And I have blown up this section drawing to show you that if you recall, it's two metres high at the moment. But what we would have is a new stone sea defence wall. Um, 4.42 meters above ordnance datum, five meters to the top of reinforced glazing here. So 4.4 to there. The public footpath would run across the top. So you'll be two two meters above where top of the wall. Um, and then uh, the public could walk along all the way. Uh, there'd be a glass screen on this side and a reinforced glass screen here that would be uh, hydraulically operated and go up if in times of flooding um, and that would reach up to 7.75 meters above ordnance datum. Obviously the glass is proposed because um, it would protect views through uh, which would otherwise be screened if it was a wall from the, the new flat developments there and um, Environment Agency have confirmed that they do not accept hydraulic mechanism for flood defences. Uh, they because they can fail in in times of flooding and that's not acceptable. So they have indicated a different form of flood defence would definitely be needed uh, than what is proposed here and at Sandbanks uh, Hotel. Um, and they have objected on the scheme at present. The um, reinforced glass and steel wave defence here uh, appearing like this uh, in, in front in elevation. Um, <clears throat> so photos of the existing flood defences, you can see the level of the, where the Sandbanks Ferry is and the steps down, a close up of the steps, the metal steps there that you can climb down. And it is public, publicly accessible, uh, but not accessible for everybody, clearly, um, and um, has a degree of, um, you know, change in slope and in uh, rough terrain. This um, shows a photograph I took and people were passing and you can see that these people are about a maximum six foot tall here, uh, 1.8 metres. So the wall is probably 2.2, 2.4 metres high as, as it exists. And so that would be going up another two metres, which would take you probably to about this height. And then you'd have the glass screen above. Um, and this is taken from the groin, looking at the length of that flood defence that would be needed. So in order to that, that's taken you through the three hotels. In order to consider the uh, sequential test at the Sandbanks and Haven hotel sites, um, we had to look at whether there were alternative sites in the uh, in the locality that could be built with 119 flats, and this plan shows you the five-year supply, uh, which could be built in the next five years with outline consent for 10 more dwellings, 10 plus dwellings, um, and it was um, based on this because the site is one site limited between the three sites we're looking at, and cross-funding is 
is subsidizing the, the potential of the development, we have to uh, use the area of search for the housing into the Sandbanks Peninsula area. Therefore, the sequential test was passed because it would be possible to accommodate, it, you, it would not be possible to accommodate 119 flats anywhere else other than the Haven Hotel site, um, which is proposed here um, based on current permissions. So we then move on to the exception test. And there's two parts to the exception test. Um, and the first part is whether there are public benefits and the second part is uh, that are sufficient and it has to pass both parts. And the second part is whether uh, it would be safe for its lifetime without increasing flooding elsewhere and would reduce flood risk overall. In this, uh, it's all set out in my report and there's quite a lot written about this in there in detail. Um, but um, the, the result of the sequential test being passed led us on to the exception test. The benefits were found to be uh, good. So therefore, the, we moved on to the second part of the test, but it has failed the exception test because it, the flood defences we have do not demonstrate to uh, that that they uh, that it would be um, it it would be safe for its lifetime without increasing flood risk elsewhere and reduce flood risk overall. So without that assurance, it's a huge risk if one was going to uh, put a block of flats there with this unresolved. Um, so. I've put some power, I'm nearly finished, members. I know it's gone on a long time. Um, there's a lot to cover being three sites, but um, I have put some slides of words here just to explain. Uh, it's a summary of some of the things in the report. So if I just explain the identified harm from fl flood risk at Sandbanks and Haven hotels, the national planning policy guidance advises that the national planning framework sets strict tests to protect people and property from flooding, which all local planning authorities are expected to follow. Where these tests are not met, national policy is clear that development should not be allowed. If a proposed development cannot be made safe, it should not be permitted. Um, and that's the position that we find ourselves in, in this situation. Um, we've had a lot, 18 months with toing and froing, with different models, with the Environment Agency, as again you will read in the report, and the wave impact assessment from the Sandbanks and Haven hotels are matters which haven't been satisfied. And the Environment Agency position for flood defences are designed. So if I just read this out, most of the Sandbanks and Haven hotel sites lie within 2133 future flood zone. In the pool SFRA 2017 and are at risk of flooding. There's a statutory consultee objection from the Environment Agency. Wave overtopping modelling and sensitivity testing has not been completed and needs to form the basis for an updated flood risk assessment. It is premature to design flood defences before modelling work has completed. The flood risk assessments do not comply with the requirements for site specific flood risk assessments in paragraphs 30 and 32 of the National Planning Practice Guidance. Sandbanks and Haven sites are at flood risk and do not demonstrate flood resilience. They are contrary to MPPF paragraphs 159 and 167. The exception test is failed at the Haven site as it cannot be demonstrated that the Haven flats would be safe for their lifetime in an area of flood risk. And again, is contrary to pool local plan policy, this time PP38 relating to sequential tests and exception tests and the MPPF paragraph 164. So um, we, in order to make a decision on this, um, we have to look at the overall economic, social and environmental benefits. 
And there are significant benefits to the tourist economy with cross subsidy from the proposed to retain in almost the same number of hotel bedrooms condensed into two new modern hotels, significant qualitative improvements to the accommodation and facilities, together with a boost to housing supply of 119 dwellings and a contribution to affordable housing. The affordable housing contribution of 2.2,180,620 is a 20% equivalent of 119 flats after viability testing. It would be 40% required, but after the viability of cross-funding a hotel, there's 20% affordable housing, but it has uh, that's now compliance with our policy given the viability testing. Um, there's a section 106 provision proposed of 100,000 off-site landscaping um, mitigation on the Sandbanks headland and to be followed by 10,000 per year for 80 years to be spent on a fund for tree planting at Sandbanks and landscaping in Dorset, AOMB and Heathland. There's sustainable building design with carbon reduction exceeding requirements. There's enhancements to sustainable transport with e-charging and cycles. There's new public rights of way at Sandbanks and Haven hotels. There's employment opportunities during construction. And there's SIL of almost 2 million following the reserve matters applications as well as new homes bonus and council tax. So as you can see, uh, the council has worked to, um, to try and achieve a development that uh, could offer a significant amount of benefits economically, socially and environmentally, and there are a lot there. We then have to move to the planning balance. The presumption in favour of housing supply is not engaged in this case, so members will be familiar on numerous cases of doing the tilted balance and weighing the benefits against the harms. Um, however, slightly different when there's flooding. So the presumption is not engaged in this case because the policies in the national planning policy framework that protect areas at risk of flooding or coastal change in section 14 of the MPPF provide a clear reason for refusing the development. So when they provide a clear reason for refusing the development, we don't do the tilted balance exercise. The harms identified, including flooding and the absence of a section 106 agreement, mean that, be, and that's because if if the application is, is to be uh, refused, there's no section 106 agreement secured. So all, the, all those benefits that I've listed above, we couldn't secure. Um, it would mean that the adv adverse impacts of the development are weighed against the benefits. They significantly and demonstrably outweigh the acknowledged benefits because there are clear reason in themselves of harm uh, when assessed against the policies in the, in the MPPF as a whole. Whilst acknowledging the considerable economic, social and environmental benefits, including additional housing and tourism developments and the contribution that this would have on provision of jobs and supporting the tourism function of the Sandbanks area, there are no material considerations that justify granting planning permission due to material breaches of relevant development plan policies in respect of flooding and to secure the necessary Section 106 agreements. The application is therefore recommended, members, for refusal on the flood grounds. You will see at page 92 of your report that the reasons set out um, and there are the, the first reason relates to the flood risk from the Environment Agency and um, the fact that the modelling hasn't been completed, flood defences need to be designed, there is risk of flooding um, and it's significant enough to refuse the application. Um, the second reason is that 
if it's at risk of flooding, it becomes an unsustainable location in accordance with your policy, planning policy two. And so the location itself becomes unacceptable for flats until that matter can be resolved. The, um, sorry, that's the third reason. The second reason was the sequential test and exception test which has been undertaken by planning policy. And you have a summary of all of that in the report showing the harm that we can't demonstrate for the lifetime of the development at the Haven Hotel, that those flats would be uh, not be at flood risk. We then have a fourth reason, which is um, about the lack of opportunity to secure all those benefits uh, from the Section 106, environmental, social and economic. So, um, members, that is the recommendation before you and ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Members of the public, before we go over to the other people that wish to make statements, would you like a five minute comfort break to stretch your legs, grab a drink? In that case, I will adjourn for five minutes. Thank you very much.
for the next part. Thank you. Claire, we're now going to go over to the residents for their speaking time. So if there are any slides or anything you have, we'll please be prepared to put them on. Yes, I will do. Mr Tyler, over to you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. So starting with those speaking in objection, we have going first Mr David Morley of the Sandbanks Community Group. Thank you. Councillors, good morning. I'm David Morley. I'm chair of Sandbanks Community Group. I've been leading the campaign against these Haven proposals for over five years. And I speak here today not only for the residents of Sandbanks, but also for the many thousands of people who stand united in their opposition to these plans. I hope that you're going to refuse this application today on flood risk grounds. And of course, we would welcome that. I should mention that we have legal advice that the nature of the flood risk objection is so fundamental, it's such a major safety issue, and the outcome is so uncertain that it is not capable of being overcome by condition, in case you were thinking of that. But we're asking you to also refuse the application on two other grounds. First, that the loss of the Haven site to hotel use is not necessary within the terms of the local plan and has not been adequately demonstrated in the way required by the local plan. And second, that too much of the value created by this scheme as proposed would be siphoned off by the owner, FJB, as profit and not enough used for affordable housing and other benefits. If you decided the Haven on a standalone basis, as opposed, separate from the other two hotels, as opposed to putting them all together, over £7 million would go to affordable housing, rather than £2 million, as has been proposed. The district valuer says that is your decision, not his. You have the power to insist on at least £7 million for affordable housing, not the two proposed. At the very least, we ask that if you refuse on flood risk grounds alone, you make it clear that doesn't mean you accept any of the officer's other conclusions by default. If not, you're inviting a new application within weeks. And we'll oppose that as consistently as we've opposed this one. We can all see that whether or not to lose the Haven Hotel for hotel use is a really fundamental issue. We have always accepted the existing hotel may need replacement. What we can't accept is that there will never again be a hotel on that site. Your decision today has far reaching consequences for jobs, tourism, public access and amenity for generations to come. It matters to many people, including everybody in this room today and including those watching live. The Haven site, famously associated with Marconi, and we have a piece on our website with a historical analysis of that, has been used continuously as a hotel for almost two centuries. It's an irreplaceable and priceless community asset. Once it's gone, it's lost forever. So why is it necessary within the terms of the local plan to lose the Haven after all these years? as a hotel. The applicants say this is the only way that you get two shiny new hotels for Sandbanks. They will draw your attention to the glitter to distract you from the price to pay the loss of a hotel site. And that's not the only way. We have a positive vision of three hotels, three new hotels on Sandbanks, not two. We've lodged evidence supported by expert opinion that proves credible hotel operator interest in developing all three sites for hotel use, not just two. The choice is not between two new, new hotels or none, or as Mr. Carr for the applicant is quoted as saying, doing nothing 
so that all three hotels, and I quote, end up as two-star venues. We can't simply accept this because the applicants say so. As a community, we need to think carefully about what they're saying. What they're asking you to conclude is that the loss of the Haven Hotel is a price worth paying for the redevelopment of two of the three sadly neglected hotels in the same ownership, FJB, for over 40 years. This flies in the face of the long accepted principle that a planning applicant should never be advantaged by their own failure to invest in significant assets like these three hotels. No one is to blame for the current neglected state of these three hotels except the owner. And it's not your job to bail out FJB with a money-making scheme that destroys a crucial public amenity, the use of the Haven site. It's not a binary choice between two new hotels or leaving all three hotels to decline, as has been presented to you. There are other options that have not been explored or given to you. Don't just take my word for that. Our property experts say, and I quote, Sandbanks represents a significant opportunity to hotel operations and currently carries a huge interest amongst many operators within the market. Here's some context. The Haven is arguably BCP's best hotel site. Let's not lose sight of that. At the mouth of Pool Harbour, a rare example of a UK hotel on a blue flag beach and with spectacular views of Old Harry, Studland and the Purbex. As one person said to me yesterday, a world heritage site in all but name. Without planning permission, the Haven site is worth, as it stands, around £13 million. That's the applicant's own estimate. With the change of use, if granted, around £45 million. As it stands, without more, simply by loss of hotel use in favour of flats. And do you know how much the applicant's estimate that all three sites would be worth once they're completed as they proposed? £145 million. And how much of that extra value is going to affordable housing? As proposed, two million when it should be seven. This isn't good enough and we have the evidence to prove it. And with an average value of at least three quarters of a million pounds, these flats proposed at the Haven, luxury flats, are definitely no answer to local housing needs. So who says it's necessary to lose the Haven? What is the evidence if you were to decide... Sorry, Mr Morley, can I just slightly interrupt you, please? You're now on seven and a half of your 15 allotted yes, minutes I know. for the three of you. OK, I just know. to let you know. Yeah. There is no evidence. The officer concludes it's necessary only because the district valuer says so. No other reasons have been given. In other words, this entire proposal, and let's get this absolutely clear, rests solely on a cold mathematical calculation based on one-sided numbers provided by the applicant. Yes, it's been side off by the district valuer, but with no market testing or independent examination of other options and using data our experts strongly contest. Councillors, this kind of exercise can be used to produce almost any result the applicants want. It's flimsy and won't survive first contact with reality. Our experts have demonstrated using the same numbers that the other two hotels can be developed with no subsidy from the Haven. Yes, you're entitled to rely on expert reports, but not blindfold and oblivious to evidence from other experts and the reality of the market. Market testing would show there are other genuine options for hotel use. We have lodged the evidence. It would be plain wrong to outsource your decision to the district valuer in this way. His report simply will not bear the weight placed on it. So I ask you again to conclude that you're not satisfied it's necessary to lose the Haven Hotel. Now, if it wasn't for the fundamental nature of the flood risk objection, there are other solid planning objections we would be making, including the scale, massing, height and dominance of the proposed development and its detrimental impact on the landscape, character and scenic quality of the area. The next speaker will address that. Councillors, in conclusion, over 6,000 people have taken the trouble to register a formal objection to the Haven proposal. I think the nearest to that is the two bridges applications you've just deferred. 
of 1200. They are in good company. The Environmental Agency, the Marconi Association, the National Trust, the RSPB and Dorset CPRE all remain against this proposal. I ask you whether the unprecedented scale of objections and public concern consistently maintained over the half a decade this application has been outstanding tells you something about the proposal. It does. It tells you now is the time to decide to refuse this application, not only on flood risk grounds, but also because it's, ne it's not necessary to lose the haven and the proposal shortchanges the people of this borough. Please bring this profoundly flawed proposal finally to a conclusive end. Thank you, Mr. Mollett. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Robert Webb of the Sandbanks Neighbourhood Forum. Thank you. Mr. Webb, just remind you there are about six minutes left of the allotted time. I'll try not to keep you. I will cut you off that 15 minutes. <laughs> Councillors, good morning. I'm Robert Webb. I'm currently chair of the Sandbanks Neighbourhood Forum, which has been developing the Sandbanks Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan for some time. It's now got to the stage it's been through two rounds of public consultation, including statutory consultees, and is shortly going to be presented to the BCP for final approval. As such, whilst it not, does not yet have formal approval, it has weight in the planning process. The most recent public consultation on the current draft included in its policy proposals the following. The two hotels currently named as Sandbanks and Haven Hotels are considered to be highly valued assets, benefiting the residents of Sandbanks and the local tourism industry. These hotels should be retained in their existing form or in a form that is sympathetic to the character, appearance and architectural heritage of the peninsula. In the responses to this consultation, 85% of the responses agreed or strongly agreed with the proposed policy. Whilst this is not a formal plebiscite, in conjunction with the extraordinary volume of objections evident on the planning portal, it forms a powerful voice in favour of retaining the three hotels. Following on from that, it is also evident from the planning officer's report that the statutory consultees' responses are pretty uniform in their objections to the proposed buildings themselves. I would ask you to include rejection of the actual designs proposed in order to respond to the objections of, inter alia, Natural England. Concerns remain relating to ongoing visual impacts, which may not be ameliorated. And Following a, a review of the amended design, the natural beauty of the AONB designation will be harmed. Dorset AONB, the proposal does not protect or enhance a number of highly sensitive views within the designated area. And your own urban design team, I remain of the opinion that the increased height fails to reflect the important local characteristic of being subservient to the tree canopy and introduces an overtly dominant form of development. development. I could go on, but I don't have time. Suffice it to say that somehow all these objections have been overridden in the planning officer's report by the promise of mitigation. So it looks like decades of protecting an extraordinary piece of coastline, maintaining an awesome seascape and coastscape with views from every angle and the construction of three staggeringly ordinary blocks of flats can be bought off by the provision of pathetically small sums in mitigation. And apparently, according to the planning officer, this will break the tree canopy a bit. So that's a bit like being a bit pregnant. And of course, the breaching of the tree canopy will provide an unassailable precedent for all future applications on sandbanks. The tree canopy uh, protection has gone. You cannot mitigate the loss of the tree canopy. Once gone, it's gone. In the same way, you cannot mitigate the loss of an iconic building. Imagine suggesting that you replace an iconic local landmark because the modern appearance of the block reflects the pattern of development in the Sandbanks area. Following this advice, it appears it would be OK to replace Buckingham Palace with a row of terraced houses, as there are a number of those in the local area. 
Undoubtedly, part of the affection of the local residents for the hotel is that it is a landmark building in the most prominent site in the entire BCP area. If it is to be lost, and we are well aware that such buildings do not last forever, but if it must go, at the very least, make it a development in keeping with the importance of the location. Let it be memorable. Let it be something that residents of BCP can be proud of. Three utterly ordinary blocks of flats are quite simply not appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And finally, we have speaking in objection, Ms. Julia Kuttner. And everybody, I'll be brief because I agree with everything they said. And they were my points too. I just want to appeal to you. Sorry, I'd just like to ask you to reject the application as a whole, because if you say yes, not only are you exposing people to flooding and ruining the environment, as stated by um, experts, you're taking away the most beautiful area in the country that should be enjoyed for free and accessible to millions of people. You will be destroying it in one stroke or one raising of your hand. And that's really all I, all I really want to say, but you'd be sacrificing nature to make somebody else wealthy and not and take away something forever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a very short statement from a Ms. Valerie Collins, who cannot be here today and has apologised as such. Um, the statement is as follows. As a permanent resident of Sandbanks, I object strongly to the proposed developments for the following reasons. Sandbanks does not have the infrastructure to cope with such a large number of additional residents, and it does not have the available space to extend the current infrastructure. We have suffered badly during warm weather when visitors have flocked to Sandbanks and car parks have overflowed, leading to blocked driveways and times when the chain ferry has not been able to unload. Should a serious incident occur on such a day, the addition of more residents and their cars and their visitors' cars may mean emergency vehicles cannot get through. A problem that has already been encountered and is known, therefore, to exacerbate this situation would amount to negligence. A high sea wall would block off that lovely seafront and interfere with rights of way along the foreshore. The culture of the area is being systematically destroyed and it would be a disaster if the Haven Hotel was to be demolished. This is the place where Marconi stayed when he made his first radio broadcast and also when he was a frequent visitor to Brown Sea Island to woo his wife. The Haven Hotel should remain a hotel. I believe there is another developer who has expressed an interest in doing just that. We already know that the services we have now, refuse collection, etc., are barely adequate given the impact of, on them of summer visitors. The development of large blocks of flats can only make this worse. Please preserve the avians of our beautiful Sandspit for residents, visitors and holiday makers to enjoy. End of statement, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Tan. And do we have other? We do. Speaking in support, we have first up uh, Mr Richard Carr and uh, or Mr Annan. Yeah, between the two of you, you have the 15 minutes um, and I understand that there are five slides to be shown. So I'd be grateful if the presenting officer could um, share those on screen. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Hello, members. Uh, the planning officer has comprehensively explained uh, the full details of the proposed schemes in our outline uh, presentation to you. Um, throughout this process, we've worked closely with your officers um, and many other internal consultees. Um, we'd like to extend our sincere thanks to all involved uh, for their notable and considerable time and effort in getting what is a complex application to this stage. Uh, following these extensive negotiations, almost all of the initial objections have been overcome with solutions found to address the key planning issues. Whilst the case officer's recommendation for this scheme is one of a refusal, this solely comes down to a flood risk objection stemming from a difference in professional opinion on the technical flood risk data. Reason for reform in your report uh, concerns a section 106 agreement, which the applicants are happy to agree to once the council have prepared it. Um, I now shall set out our reasoning for why, when weighing up all the planning uh, issues, members will hopefully conclude that the significant positives uh, that scheme delivers will outweigh the one sole concern. Firstly, looking at flood risk. Your officer advises in her report that further flooding modelling is required in respect of wave overtopping. However, three times our consultants, Waterco, have agreed data sets with the Environment Agency, as well as agreeing parameters and their methodology. 
the EA doesn't have any data for wave modelling in this location. We've provided it for them at great expense through hydraulic modelling reports. Three times the goalposts have been moved and further data required. In their latest response in May this year, the EA advised we were hoping to re soon reach a position where we were satisfied with the wave over toggling assessments undertaken. So it's clear we aren't far off. And this is a case of a professional difference of opinion between our flood consultants and the EA. As you've heard, we've looked at putting in a reinforced glass wave defence above a stone sea wall for protection against a, a freak storm of this nature, which may or may not ever happen. However, as yet, this has not been accepted by the Environment Agency. Incidentally, no other development on Sandbanks has this level of protection, nor did the ACE development, a new built flatter development, right directly adjacent to the Sandbanks Hotel. Our response has been to set land levels at 3.6 AOD, which is commonly accepted on other waterfront developments to take into account of the sea, future sea level rises. In addition to this, we are proposing the stone, we, st stone sea wall defence and with reinforced glazing above. This is in, well in excess of the existing land levels and sea defences and thus provides a betterment over the existing situation. In addition, the scheme proposes a significant increase on the area of permeable uh, land within the site, improving the drainage, which again provides an improvement over the existing situation. I've recently learned that if members approve the scheme today, the EA have requested that they apply some planning conditions, indicating to us that actually an acceptable arrangement in flood risk terms could be achieved and secured by a condition. Secondly, character and appearance. The design of these buildings, in particular on the Haven and the Sandbanks, have evolved considerably throughout the course of the application, as you've seen, which resulted in a significant reduction in density and site coverage, together with scale. The Haven buildings are now only 1.8 metres taller than the highest point of the existing building. Furthermore, the long original perimeter block that you saw has been broken up into separate buildings, which improves the articulation and enables views through the site to the tree backdrop behind. On all three sites, contemporary flat-roofed architecture incorporates clean curved lines with a strong horizontal effort emphasis and a tiered design floor stepping in which will make a positive contribution to their location. The Sandbanks Hotel for instance will provide an iconic transitional development between the mainland and the neck of Sandbanks Peninsula. An inventive use of modern material palette and innovative fenestration arrangements keep the built form lightweight whilst taking full advantage of these fantastic sea views. Basement parking on all schemes uh, significantly reduces the amount of tarmac on the site and surface parking from that of the existing, uh, providing the opportunity for plentiful landscape areas. Thirdly, trees and ecology. An arboriculture report has been provided confirming acceptable tree to building arrangement can be secured. This, together with a comp comprehensive landscaping design incorporating tree replanting, has been accepted by the Council's Tree Officer. Comprehensive ecology surveys have been provided with a robust scheme for biodiversity enhancements, resulting in Council's ecologists being in full support of the scheme. The Council's Highway Officer raises no objection, confirming sufficient parking has been provided as part of the development, which will have electric vehicle charging access. In conclusion, Councillors, we firmly consider the scheme represents an opportunity not to be missed to regenerate, to redevelop the three tired hotels with a sustainable mix of uh, character of the same mix of hotel and residential accommodation, whilst not detrimentally impacting the character and appearance of the area, neighbouring me to our highway safety. I very much hope that you are willing to move to and approve this proposal today and support this iconic development. Good afternoon, Chairman, members, officers, members of the public. The application before you today consists of three substantial properties in BH13. For the ease of reference, I wish to deal with them one at a time. I, however, would like to mention that the aims of BCP have been taken account in this application. One, protecting and enhancing Poole's beautiful environment in a sustainable way, so that it is a great place to live, work and play. Two, promoting Poole's economic growth and regeneration by attracting investment in business, housing and jobs for all. Firstly, I'd like to deal with the Haven Hotel. We've got that slide up. Thank you. There is a rumour that this is a beautiful building, and I would agree once upon a time it was. English Heritage have had an application to list it and refused to list it as it did not have any merit. This site is no longer suitable for a hotel. In fact, the objectors that you've just listened to, one in particular, Mr. David Morley, said on the 21st of June to the Daily Echo, I quote, Sandbanks residents felt trapped in their own homes because of traffic gridlock. 
the management of this hotel is no longer able to take bookings for weddings and time critical events because of the uncertainty of people being able to get to the venue at a scheduled time. On top of that, how would you feel if you're a family that saved up all year to go on holiday, you took your children to Portons Park and then spent an hour and a half in queues of traffic trying to get back to your hotel? This is further ex exasperated by staff who have to leave home on a hot day at least an hour early to get to work on time. That cannot be acceptable to people on minimum hours contracts and low paid staff. Yesterday, you visit, visited the hotel and saw exposed steel beams with your own eyes, some of which are 30 to 40 percent decayed after 100 years of wind and salt water. We have supplied the LPA with a structural report written by Calcinotto, a firm who also act for BCP, I might add, who have concluded that structural failure of the building in the foreseeable future is highly likely. I recently had a conversation with someone on this matter who suggested to me that you could slide horizontally the RSJs out of position and replace them. Clearly, that would not be possible due to the enormity of the steel structure. And even if it was possible, how would you replace the vertical steels that effectively hold the weight of the building? I would now like to address the one material reason for your office's recommendation for refusal, and that is the Environment Agency's objection. The development before you today gives a flooding betterment as the building will be elevated to three point meters AOD, that's above ordnance datum. So the new building will be at 3.8 meters the ground floor. The current building is about 1.2. There clearly would be a, an enhanced position if this was granted with regards to flooding, even at today and even with not having recommendation from the Environment Agency. We have spent over £75,000 in reports to the Environment Agency, answering their questions on every occasion. They have moved the goalposts, therefore making our position untenable. What I consider to be extremely important in, in, in your decision today is that the Environment Agency has said to the planning officer that should this application be approved, they would want to have the requirement to apply conditions to the permission. This would suggest to me that there is a satisfactory solution available at this point. Moving on, the Sandbanks Hotel. The hotel sits on a blue flag beach and is the only hotel in the United Kingdom to do so. Therefore, one would suggest that it deserves to be an outstanding facility. Clearly, a lot of people are hugely disappointed when visiting this hotel. It is dated, decrepit and is not the image of a resort that wishes to portray itself as an international venue. What we are proposing is, is on this site is a modern family friendly hotel with spas, restaurants, bars and abundance of hospitality for guests to enjoy and remember and of course the local community. Moving on now to the Harbour Heights. The Harbour Heights Hotel is to locals a very pleasant and magnificent venue for a drink on a hot summer's day. However, it is a particularly ugly building that has had various extensions over the years, was originally built to house crew and engineers for the flying boats before the Second World War. The bedrooms are very small and the hotel has no spa facilities or an indoor swimming pool. What we propose to build is a new apart hotel that will have rooms with lounges and to substantially enhance the amenity values of the hotel. The terrace, which we all enjoy, will be made slightly larger and on the roof of the hotel will be a new restaurant overlooking the Purvex. The current hotel offers th 38 bedrooms, which will be increased in numbers to 70. I would now like to summarise some in important issues that this development would create, starting with biodiversity and ecology. The application does not just give the borough new facilities, but changes substantially the amount of green space by the removal of acres of black tarmac at all three hotels. In fact, this application creates 9,672 square metres of green space by the removal of those car parks. This would be the largest creation of green space in the borough in living memory, enabling indigenous plants and green, landscape, green landscaping for the betterment of the community and the area. Clearly, this point alone should add significant weight to your decision making. Moving on now to energy and carbon emissions.
provide, providing additional green space and areas for wildlife is only half of our solution. We hear daily about the impact of human being, beings on the planet. Fortitudo, for, in, for, for, for instance, have not installed a gas boiler since 2017. I am pleased to say that all the apartments in bo and both the new hotels, should they be granted, would be powered by air source heat pumps and the most modern energy saving technology. We've commissioned a report that suggests the Samax Hotel would use 61% less energy and, and create 24% less carbon if granted. The Haven Hotel would use 69% less energy and 55% less carbon emissions. And the Harbour Heights would use 55% less energy and create 40% less carbon than it does today. In 2019, BCP Council declared a climate emergency, which was ratified by full council. Clearly, what we are proposing today creates a giant step forward to this goal. In summary, I conclude. There is a technical reason for the refusal in the section. Uh, uh, there, yes, there are some technical reasons for refusal, as the Section 106 hasn't yet been drawn up by BCP Council, as clearly a Section 106 will, will require the local authority's signature and sealing. This development provides the local authority with £2.1 million in social housing provision, £1.9 million in SIL, and the development also provides a payment of £100,000 plus £10,000 per annum for 80 years for, for replanting trees and sandbags. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also have two ward councillors with us this morning, uh, Councillor Ainga and Councillor Mayhans. Would you... One of you wish to start speaking, please. Thank you, Chairman, committee members, visitors, members of the public tuning in. I'm Councillor Mohan Iyengar, uh, Ward Councillor for Canford Cliffs, including Sandbanks, uh, and also until recently Cabinet Member for Tourism as well for BCP. Chairman, committee members, can let me first address a couple of the points made um, from the, um, the previous speaker. First of all, let's make it emphatically clear that the vast majority of the 6,000 objections to this application are not arguing for the preservation of the current building on the Haven site. Let's make that perfectly clear to everyone, okay? The argument is for the protection of the site as a hotel venue for all the reasons, for all the benefits that an open hotel function will fulfill on that site, everything it represents. It is not for the preservation of the current building. Let's be very, very clear about that. The second thing is, as a mark, as proof of the residents' reasonableness throughout all of this, there's also significantly very few objections to the Harbour Heights and to the Sandbanks Hotel developments as well, proposals as well, okay? With some things at the margin, but largely those things are seen in somewhat a favorable light. I think the residents have shown their class by being very, very selective across 6,000 objections, being very selective as to what it is they're objecting to, and it absolutely does focus in on the Haven site. Now, let me turn to the point since transport was mentioned, and there seems to be a couple of mixed messages on this one. One is, for instance, that there's huge congestion in some banks, and indeed, at times, there can be. And therefore, I think from the last speech, there was a sort of a, a, a suggestion that it actually this will help the transport congestion in a way by having um, homes which are in a fewer number rather than a hotel which could invite a larger number of people. That goes against completely, uh, turning to my cabinet role formally, of literally what the future path is for visitors coming to Sandbanks, visits, events, conferencing and everything, which is it's, uh, it's on a inevitable upward trend. And what the council, cabinet members, others need to be planning for is a significant expansion in the quantity and the quality of facilities and wherewithal available to everybody who comes. Residents, businesses, conferences, and tourists as well. And that's partly due to the facilities available, but also a far-reaching transport policy as well for the area. I couldn't believe when I believe, saw that one part of this is to remove car parks. I mean, that would be cataclysmic, what that will do for the area, to remove car parking capacity and the effect on car congestion in the area. But what we need is a far-reaching policy for how people can get there in a sustainable way. Now, 
We need much more good quality hotel space. Pool in general and BCP in general is woefully short of middle to higher end hotel space. We're a premier place on the South Coast. We are noted by several national, international businesses as sorely lacking in hotel space. For businesses, for meetings, for conferencing, for events, and for tourism stopovers. What's being proposed here at The Haven is high-end luxury flats, and has been previously mentioned by Mr. Morley, something three quarters of a million upwards. Not quite the definition that we usually use in the BCP as affordable housing. I suspect really the sill is a juicy thing to go after there for councillors. I suspect we shouldn't really be, be using that as a motivation, I must say. It takes out of permanent circulation the dual in the area, the dual site in the area. And the really, councillors, there is no precedent for in a premier resort, what is the dual site in the middle of it being taken in an exclusive way for private residences. The norm is to keep it as open as possible for as many people as possible and for private residences to be further back away and more secluded. And as a final comment, and as a final comment, I, I must raise an objection to, in the planning officer's run through, an attempt to sort of broaden and talk about the broader tourism picture and the benefits of this. Well, as members will know, there was a significant exercise in the seafront strategy to look at the entire coastline from Hamworthy to Highcliffe and to think about what is actually needed along our seafront. And many of the inputs were that for, from cruise liners, tourism operators, hoteliers, and various other people. And all of them in the objections are united in the view that that site must remain, the Haven site must remain a kind of an open to all, hotel related, free roaming site and become an absolute jewel. It would be an absolute crime to take it away from that purpose. Thank you, committee members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Councillor Hay May Haynes. I'm the other ward councillor for Canford Cliffs. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the planning committee, you've heard the representations made by the objectors to this application. I agree and support the case that they have reasoned and set out before you. I thank the case officer for a very clear report on what is a very complex application. I do, however, disagree on the acceptability of the cross-funding arrangements that is deemed to have satisfied PP23. The three hotels, while under the same ownership, can and do run as individual entities in their own right. PP23 makes reference that exception can be deemed acceptable if it satisfies PP40. And PP40 talks about viability as well as change of use to alternate uses. And it includes within PP40 changing hotels of 10 bedrooms or more to residential use. Specifically, PP40 paragraph 2B requires that part of evidence required to demonstrate non viability is proper marketing of the site for its existing use at a reasonable value for at least 12 months and for relet. As far as can be ascertained, no such marketing has been undertaken for the Haven Hotel site. Should the Haven be sold and remain as a hotel facility, I'm not saying that we retain the Haven, but retain the site for hotel use, the proceeds can be used to upgrade the sandbanks as well as the Harbour Heights, while retaining visitor tourist accommodation offer on all three sites. There is a direct conflict here. And I would put it to you, members of the committee, that the viability has not been adequately satisfied and is such another reason for refusal. The area of Sandbanks is an increasingly popular destination. Hotel accommodation with far reaching sea views, such as offered at the Haven, enhances visitors' experience. I was speaking with a local restaurant manager, I was told that many of the customers do actually book into the Haven Hotel to make a night out more enjoyable. So no worries about drinking and driving as they're able to walk back to the nearby hotel. There was a small fire recently at the Haven and I was told by the same restaurant manager that they had received quite a number of cancellations because customers were no longer able to use the hotel facility. So this actually demonstrates that the loss of a hotel at that site would impact local businesses and therefore the local economy. BCP, as we know, is a tourist destination with a premier destination on Sandbanks. 
And it is summed up nicely in our recent seafront strategy consultation document. This is what it says about sandbanks. Top zone for holiday makers, beach and water sport enthusiasts, with its unique residential community alongside one of Britain's most celebrated beaches. Now, tourism and the hospitality sector is the highest grossing industry in BCP. And therefore, it is vital that we need to retain our hotel stock, particularly in pool. And as Councillor Iyengar has said, we do not have as many or as much choice of hotels as in Bournemouth. Um, I also like to address, I think, the landscape mitigation that the case officer had alluded to. Yes, while it's welcome that 100,000 has been secured, um, my view would be that in planting those trees, it would take them years to grow to maturity and provide that sylvan setting, which has been lost as a result of the bulk massing and height of the proposed blocks of flats. So therefore, as was mentioned before, that I think by Mr. Webb, the mitigation doesn't go far enough because the landscaping and the sylvan setting, which is the backdrop to the current hotel where it is, will be lost and replacement would take absolutely years to actually achieve. Um, I think, and then the other points I wish to address were some of the points that were raised by the applicant, um, who states that actually this is, it was, it is being refused on technical assessment issues and that understandably they do not agree with what the environment agency have said. Now they are a statutory body, they are the experts, and they have actually said that hydraulic arrangement for flood defences is simply not acceptable, just not acceptable. Um, and it is therefore a material breach of uh, planning policy, as has been set up by the case officer. Um, Chairman, as you can see by the number of people that are in attendance, a number of representations that have been received in objection to this application before you. It demonstrates without a doubt that there is a significant community benefit that is valued by those that live nearby, as well as those that visit the area. Chairman, I think that's all I have to say. You've heard all the other points that have been raised. All I would say is to follow the officer's recommendation and refuse on the reasons that she has set up very clearly, but also to refuse on a further condition or a further reason, which is the contravention of PP40 paragraph 2 subsection B on viability and the fact that that can still remain a hotel on the site where the Haven currently is. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillors. Thank you. Claire? Claire, are you back in the room? I am back in the room. Thank you. I am. Um, do you have anything on what you've heard from both sides that you would like to respond to before I open the debate to the members? Um, I would just like to pick up on um, on one comment that has been made about the uh, way in which we um, considered the viability assessments and whether that was the right approach. And I would just like to remind members um, that the planning policy PP23 that refers to how we assess enabling investment in hotels does not refer to planning policy 40 about viability. So the test, uh, whilst there's been objection from a number of people about the way in which it's been assessed, we, um, in order to try and the, um, prevent hotels having to fall into disrepair and then be marketed, and we're, we've got rundown hotels in disrepair needing to be marketed before it can be proved that they need to be replaced. Um, the planning policy 23 and your fairly new local plan in 2018 actually offered this opportunity for enabling investment to cross subsidise elsewhere in pool area. And um, so we are applying planning policy 23 B2, um, not B1, um, which talks about the viability. So um, 
I just wanted to clear that up that we um, the, your your officers have assessed it in accordance with your adopted planning policy for housing and uh, for for tourism. Thank you very much, Claire. Members, before I open, can I just remind members that we've heard a lot from both sides and a lot of what we have heard has been speculation. We're not here to speculate on what might be done or what could be done by other developers if they wish to come through. We're here today to deal with this as one application. We are not dealing with it as three separate sites. We're dealing it as one application. So I would ask you to bear that in mind when and if you have questions for the officers, etc. So at this point, I will now open the debate to members who would like to kick off the debate, please. Anyone? Councillor Hilliard, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Th this is the first application I've seen where three properties are dealt as one. So I I've been looking through the sections covering the district valuer from about 220, but could, could either the legal officer or the planning officer just give it a little bit more bones on how the decision or why the decision to look the, the viability with the district valuer, how that's progressed and, and taking from what someone said in uh, uh, earlier, why part of the assessment was not to say, well, to sell it to fund the other two, if, if, if that is appropriate in the district valuer assessment. Thank you. Sorry, Claire, do you think you could respond to that, please? Yes, I can do. Um, hopefully my camera's now on. Oh, it's gone off again. There we are. Is it on now? Can you see no, me? It's fine if it's not on. Oh, there it is. It's arrived. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, yes. Um, we, we have applied the um, cross-subsidy policy um, for the reasons that I said um, just now, that we are trying to make sure that we maintain the amount of tourism that we can um, in the in the area for the sake of the economy. Um, can you just remind me of the last point you asked, sorry, councillor, in your question, so that I can um, yeah, that, make sure I answer it. it? Yeah, it was just noted in one of the uh, objectors, I think, saying that they would have expected that one of the viability assessments was to say, well, could the sale of one of the properties fund yeah. the other two? Yes. Um, so that that hasn't been reviewed uh, because that isn't what the applicant is asking for. Uh, so whilst other people might look at whether that could work, um, the viability testing that we've done is related to the application as submitted, which is what we have to decide. And the application is submitted in this way because the same hotel owner owns all three. Um, I don't believe the hotel owner was wishing to sell uh, one of them if um, they could secure a way of getting nearly all of the accommodation that was in the three on two um, to be funded by themselves. So it's the way it came forward. It is an unusual way to approach something, but it isn't um, in terms of trying to secure the appropriate tourism that's required for, um, for the area, for this area, it was a way of achieving it. And it's that way that that members need to decide whether they're they're satisfied that that was a reasonable way to do it. All I can say is it, it does comply with our policy, which says that providing it can be adequately demonstrated that the loss is necessary to enable investment in the remaining tourist accommodation on site or elsewhere, it can be permitted. So that is your policy planning policy pp23 and clearly there is an option um i think it is so difficult with hotels uh getting run down needing to be replaced and to keep the tourism in place when housing competes so much against uh, given the land values um we haven't seen any other hotels coming forward with applications for um any of these sites and therefore 
we have followed this approach of the planning policy 23. I know that doesn't fully answer your question about the yeah. sale, but I can't, you know, we have no, to no, look no, at no, the, what fine. we're looking at and assess it on that basis. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Yeah. Members, members of the public, could I just remind you that when you were speaking, all of the members were incredibly courteous and kept quiet throughout. Could we please keep it that way when the officers are speaking so that we can all hear exactly what's being said, please? Thank you very much. Members, back to you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this? Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, it's, it's more of a, a, a financial question. I, I fully understand uh, in occasions in business the needs to cross subsidise by the movement or sale of assets. Um, and there has been mention made of uh, you know, almost a queue of hoteliers wishing to buy this area, into this area. I'm not aware of those. But what I would ask is, given this current state of the Haven Hotel, if we know, what would it realise if it was put onto the open market? What's the best estimate? And in terms of the hotel group, what would they realise if apartments were put in, in terms of revenue or uh, profit back to themselves? Because there does seem to be a dynamic there that suggests that if we sell one in a particular way, it allows the other two to be developed. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I can try and answer that. In, in the viability testing that we have undertaken, the figures demonstrated that there would actually be a loss um, if the Haven Hotel um, was replaced as um, a hotel. So there would be, and I, I can't give you the exact figure, um, but I have a recollection that it was going to cost £5 million to demolish the hotel. And I think there was a loss of about £3 million uh, in terms of the, the profit um, if, if it were to be a hotel, but because of the extent, the expensive demolition costs for the site, and these were all verified by uh, the district valuer service who undertakes our viability is completely independent. Um, and he didn't agree with all of the figures, everything generally came down a bit. So he would perhaps say that there was, um, you know, a, a million pounds difference at some points, but nothing to change the general figures that have come forward. And therefore, it has been looked at that the cost um, of the hotel to be the Haven Hotel to be demolished and rebuilt as a hotel um, would would not be um, viable. Thank you, Claire. Catch right now. Thank you, Chairman. If I have, I've got a subsequent question. Um, yeah, it's it's more to do with the, the flood risk assessment. The Environment Agency has objected to uh, the risk of, on the basis of risk of flooding. Uh, in terms of the proposal, can the officer just re remind us of the proposed enhancements to the flood defences for the Sandbanks and Haven hotels? And perhaps you would also like to comment on an observation in that when doing a flood risk assessment, whether it's the Environment Agency or others, it is largely a forecast and a mathematical computation enhanced by a degree of judgment. Uh, and depending on who you give the numbers to, they can come out with very different assessments. Uh, perhaps you, the officer could comment on that. Thank you. Claire? Uh Yes, I I can. So um, the flood the flood defences. Would you like me to show the the picture of those again? Is that the best way to explain uh, what they would be? I think um, that would be helpful, Claire. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I will try and find those quickly. Um, it's down towards the bottom. Right. Um, so, can you see the screen now with the on the bottom right corner, the flood defences for the Haven Hotel? We can. Thank you, Claire. Okay. So, so 
the proposal is to increase what's about two meters high just above these rocks here to four um 4.42 so that the flood wall would be um would be doubled in size is what is the proposal that if you approve it today uh well you can't so let me explain actually a bit more about the policy so um the, the fact that um, Environment Agency are a statutory consultee means that should um, the flood defences uh, be considered, you know, if should members want to approve the application today, they have to be mindful that the application has to be sent to the Secretary of State, which I have explained in the report, so that the um, Secretary of State can decide whether to call in this application because the flood risk is uh, such a significant matter to, uh, to have that in place, that that is part of the requirements. So um, Secretary of State would then see the application and make a decision whether they wish to call it in and make a decision or refer it back to, to the council to make a decision on it. Um, the um, Environment Agency position about uh, how the flood defences are designed uh, is that they, they required some further sensitivity testing of different parts of the um, where the waves actually reach the wall and what impacts that might have if a you know, with adjoining properties and flooding on adjoining properties if a flood defence would be put in. So before the flood defences are designed a, uh, and before a flood risk assessment is provided, the, the modelling of where the flooding is likely to hit the hardest is, um, is, is not yet calculated. Um, and therefore, um, this this flood defence here, uh, it may be above and beyond what is required. It may be um, less than is required. It it may be a completely different form of flood defence is required, uh, and that is the difficulty that we have. And it, it may be in the wrong places. Um, it may be needed you know to to be different in different areas of the site so because of that and because the environment agency is the statutory body that determines this and because it is a protected area in terms of the national planning framework it prioritizes flood risk and because of global warming etc the flood risk has to be prioritized and resolved first and therefore this would go before the Secretary of State if you were to be inclined to approve um, in order to to see if they wish to um, if, if they wish to determine it or, or revert it. And the flood defences, yes, I can explain this one again, but I have explained that the hydraulic glass panels um, are not acceptable to the Environment Agency. So whatever flood defence is proposed, it will not be what you see here. It would have to be a new version. And the Sandbanks Hotel, I will just, uh, I think it was this one, uh, shows uh, again uh, a four metre wave impact glass, uh, sorry, a four metre high wall where it's, as you could see, um, well, that, that's that's not as proposed because this is an earlier version, but as you did see on the photographs of the current wall, it's 2.2 metres high roughly, and this would go up to four metres high um, and with a, up to seven, so the further 3.05 with, with glass screen above here. Um, so I hope that's explained um, why the flood defences, you know, the flood risk assessment comes after the after the modelling, after the modelling of where the the waves impact. After that, you just draw up a flood risk assessment. We do have a flood risk assessment from the applicant, but it's um, 
it's not taking account of any of the modeling work that they've undertaken. It's a historic one and they've designed their flood risk uh, defenses on the basis of a of a historic um, <clears throat> a historic flood risk assessment. Thank you, Claire. Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, if I, if I may, uh, Chairman. Uh, I mean, the, the development of the, the, the flood risk calculations to one side uh, seems quite a, a substantial improvement in the height as a, a method of defence. Um, if one looks along that peninsula, um, probably from the start of uh, Shore Road, Banks Road, uh, down to the Haven, there, are, there have been recently and even today are a number of substantial developments. How have they been treated on the flood risk vis-a-vis -vis this application, bearing some of those are currently under construction? Thank you, Claire. Um, I, I don't think I can actually really answer that question for the member because um, each site, as we all know, is viewed on its merits. Each site is looked at at the time that it is it is decided. Um, I don't know, for example, the adjoining property at Ace Building that adjoins the Sandbanks Hotel it may well be that the floor level has been raised a lot higher than what is proposed on this one, but I haven't personally done a comparison of all the other flood risk assessments that have happened on all the recent developments. Uh, it would take some research to undertake that. So personally, I can't offer any um, clarity on how they're different and why they're different, but I can confirm that the Environment Agency will have reviewed every single one. And if they have been concerned at the modelling work that's been undertaken, they will have pursued it and they would have then asked for a flood risk assessment uh, to be provided showing the sea defences. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, just one uh, slight follow up question on that and I understand the answer fully and appreciate the answer. Um, from what you've said and what's in the paper, if this project were to be approved, it would automatically go to the Secretary of State for a judgment. Um, if it goes to the Secretary of State, would they overturn it or insist on conditions with the de developer? Um, the Secretary of State would decide whether they uh, think that they would be looking at um, they would be looking at the application, like if you were refusing, well, if you were refusing this application on flood risk, it would not have to go to the Secretary of State. So if you were recommending approval, as I understand it, and I'm quite happy for others uh, at the table there to uh, explain how the, str the process would work. But as I understand it, what would happen would be that you would need to, first of all, defer the application for um, consultation with the Environment Agency to be able to draft some conditions, potentially of the Grampian condition format, uh, which would be suggesting that unless and until all this mod modelling work has been undertaken, a flood defence, an NFRA shall be produced and a flood, um, a flood defence designed and agreed. Uh, it's if that did happen. Um, Environment Agency wouldn't normally do that unless they're certain that a, a, a solution is there to be found. Um, they've indicated they hope there's a solution to be found, but they haven't said there is. And therefore, um, they would have to do some form of Grampian condition uh, to suggest, to, to put before the Secretary of State. And we as officers would have to put an, a whole list of conditions relating to every aspect of the uh, hotel's design and everything else, um, layout, landscape, all of these. We would have to draft a series of conditions. Um, we could not do, I mean, that would be a couple of days work. Uh, we can't do it at the end of this committee. So it would be um, necessary to defer. And then whether that then comes back to the committee for consideration in its revised form and verification or whether it goes back to the chairman or to the head of planning, 
um, I, I will seek advice on that part of the procedure from those at the top table there. Thank you, Claire. Uh, members, I'm going to ask Mr Firth to step in on this point, please. Mr Firth? Yes, thank you, Chairman. So, so as I understand the situation, the reason this is potentially subject to what's called a call-in would be because of a direction that the Secretary of State has issued, which is a general direction on various matters, not relating specifically to this application, but all applications, and particularly in this relation, in this case, it would apply because the um, Environment Agency are opposing the scheme and have continued to oppose the scheme, notwithstanding discussions with the local planning authority. If it gets called in, what essentially that means, it goes before the Secretary of State to consider whether he wants to intervene or not, because the Secretary of State has absolute rights to intervene and take over responsibility for determining the application. If he chose to do that, then in my experience, what invariably happens is he, if he exercised the right to call it in, he would hold it, get an independent inspector to hold an inquiry and make recommendations to the Secretary of State. So essentially, you wouldn't be a, a case of us just offering conditions. You would probably end up with an inquiry held before an independent inspector and then the Secretary of State would review that and reach his own determination. Thank you very much, Mr Firth. Councillor Brown, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'll come back later to my views overall of the application and the, and the issues. Um, but just a sort of question and a bit of clarification around one area particularly. Um, in the case officer's report, paragraphs 303 to 314, it talks about the impacts on the Dorset AOMB and the landscape comp compensation, the sort of tree fund um, that's been established to mitigate that. Um, and it talks there about the National Planning Policy Framework requiring conservation enhancement of the landscape, etc. It except that there's an impact on the AONB and the tree line around the Haven Hotel, particularly with the height of the proposal. But then it talks about Natural England have found acceptable the package of off-site moderation measures. Okay, so, so it talks about Natural England have accepted the package of off-site moderation measures um, and paragraph 312 talks about the funding for that, the £100,000 plus the £10,000 index linked for the next 80 years being spent within 10 kilometres of the development site. Now I'm concerned that these funds, which would be probably, well, index linking probably in excess of a million pounds over the years, wouldn't necessarily enhance the immediate area of the set of the Haven Hotel and may be spent, you know, many, many miles away. So it talks about the Section 106 agreement. Would any of that funding be ring fenced for the Sandbanks Peninsula? And what happens if those funds aren't drawn down? If there's not schemes within the AOMB to, to fund, what would happen with the money? Could, it, could we have a situation where this fund just builds up and up and up and it's not actually drawn and used in mitigation? Claire, can you answer that, please? Yes, I can. Um, so, the uh, of the eight hundred thousand um, pounds identified, one hundred thousand pounds. Well, one hundred thousand pounds is to be um, spent before the first commencement of any development of this application. A hundred thousand pounds is to be made available to be spent on the Sandbanks Peninsula itself at the headland, replacing pines that need replacing, putting new pine pines in which will grow up. Um, the fund will operate very much like the Witch Farm oil field one did um, and has been running successfully for 30 years um, uh, to offset impacts in Pool Harbour and and the Dorset AOMB. Um, so a hundred thousand pounds is is to be provided to to provide that tree cover, get it growing up as soon as possible. Um, obviously, it will be a good twenty years before they're a really good height. But in replacing those that are um, at reaching maturity by then, they will be a good height and then continue growing to sixty years. So. Um, that is a, a key benefit of the compensation and the other part, the 10,000 per year, uh, can be spent at Sandbanks if there is uh, people, if, if there are claims or, or requests for that, but it can also be spent in the Dorset AOMB Heathland area, which is impacted uh, in terms of its setting. 
um, and the relevant policies of the national planning framework allow for um, in compensation for within the setting of the a AOMB and <clears throat> which is set out in my report. So therefore, um, they will be trying to secure a uh, landscape and it won't be trees in the Dorset heathland, but it will be um, invested in the heathland itself and the heathland landscape and in access tracks um, to make sure that those that are accessing from the development um, into the Studland area will be um, able to identify the specific tracks to allow the natural heathland habitat to remain unharmed. So it's a dual function. It's partly for the Dorset AOMB objection to address their impacts and it is partly uh, to do with the height of the tree cover and the need to address landscape impacts on the peninsula. So it serves two purposes. If it's not spent, uh, then I mean, it does need to be monitored and all the, all the agreement for how that will be monitored and, and how that will be promoted and publicized so people are continually aware that they uh, can call on that fund uh, will be um, will be carried out um, as within you know the the requirements of how that works will be in the section 106 agreement but it will operate like the witch farm oil field uh, agreement and that has worked successfully over 30 years and um, has been the model for how we do this thank you very much Claire. any other members wishing to speak at this time councillor Pedro. Thank you. Mine's a, probably a bit technical question. Um, a lot's been made about the energy saving and the reduced carbon being emitted once the structures would be occupied, were they to go ahead. Um, but it involves demolition of three properties, basically. Three plus, three major properties, plus outbuildings and things. Um, there is a perception now that demolition is not the best option if possible if refurbishment could happen because of the embedded carbon that is released and i'm wondering if any calculations have been done about it the embedded carbon release in these in this situation thank you claire do you have some I'm not that, I'm not aware of any calculations that have been done but obviously if members are minded to approve uh, the scheme um, and, and want to put forward conditions about the manner of the demolition and how that shall be done. There would always be a construction environment management plan for a scheme like this, and that would cover all those issues uh, about the manner in which it is it, it is undertaken to uh, satisfy our policies about carbon emissions and so on. So um, that 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 would be the normal way to deal with it. Um, and so um, normally that level of detail isn't provided in the application itself. Thank you very much, Claire. Back to members. Councillor Rice. Thank you. Um, on a similar technical aspect with regards to the carbon footprint of the buildings once up and running, um, they have mentioned about um, uh, having heat. Uh, ground source uh, heat pumps um, and reducing their carbon footprint once the building is up and running. Um, but they also speak about switching from having um, non-air conditioned rooms at the moment to having air conditioned rooms. Um, and so, uh, okay, it's more energy efficient, but they're going to be using more energy. Um, and I just wondered whether there was any comments in terms of the building design so designing out the requirement for air conditioning um, through um, passive stack ventilation or increased shading. There's an awful lot of glass, for example, that doesn't uh, that leads to the need to use air conditioning, um, for example, in the actual design. Claire? Um, well, the 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 um, development exceeds the um, sustainable construction requirements, we can't require that there shall be no air conditioning in buildings at all, but, but um, 
what I can suggest is that um, if if members were minded, I mean, personally, I think that people in visiting or, or living in flats in that location are quite likely to uh, require air conditioning on occasions. And, and I think that therefore, um, you know, it, it, as long as they have met their sustainable requirements in other respects and they've exceeded it by more than double in 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 a lot of places, uh, then I I think that that um, is not something that would be reasonable to require of them. Um, however, should members be wanting to grant permission and wanting to uh, condition uh, that prior to any air conditioning uh, being installed, passive uh, ventilation could be would be explored to see if it would be uh, successful in the design and could be incorporated. There's no reason why something like that could not be inserted. Uh, but I personally, I I would think that it's you know we, there there is no policy ground uh, to require greater than ten percent um, of the sustainable construction, and in that respect. It, it would be a, a wish list rather than a, uh, a requirement by policy. Thank you, Claire. Councillor Rice, did you want to come back? Councillor Barron, please. Thank you, Chairman. And no offence, Councillor Rice, but feeling it here today, I won't be supporting that. Um, as much as I care about the environment, please don't, don't misunderstand me. Um, I just can't see it being successful. Um, I have to say, to my mind, the Haven should be should not do, be demolished. We only have to look at the wonderful restoration of the former Savoy, now the Nicky Hotel on the West Cliff, to see what can be achieved with an old hotel, should an owner be minded to do so. And regarding the, the, the structural uh, stills, um, it, you've got a sort of, well, I know, I know it's not the same type of building, but the Empire State Building um, has had stills, structural stills, uh, replaced in that successfully, which says to me there is a way of doing it, um, especially with the with the balcony stills that were shown to us yesterday. They're not particularly low bearing. This is not nothing particularly heavy above them, other than a, other than a balcony. Um, the ones in the basement, I, I can see that they they could be they could be braced either side by by new 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 stills bridging across and welded to the to the good metal above. But that's that's just just my take on it. So I'm I am. You know, I understand the building isn't isn't listed, but it really doesn't sit well with me to knock down the haven. It really doesn't. Back to members again. Councillor Hall. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On site visit, the officer mentioned there's three trees at the entrance to Sandbanks Hotel, um, and you're going to let us know which trees they were that may be fell. Have you sorted that out, please? Claire? Yes, yes, I have. Um, I, so the two trees that we were looking at that were right against the business centre, they are definitely being removed. And there is one very small tree, which I don't recall seeing, but um, it, it was shown on the plan. I can actually show you. Um, let me just, uh, I can point them out on the layout plan, which ones are to be removed. It is on the general layout plan. Sorry, I'm just going to have to open up this PowerPoint again. Um, and I'll just find the, the relevant. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was on that plan. It's not on the plan that I've got, I don't think, on the. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah. OK. It's not terribly clear on this plan, but I, I've got to share it. Sorry. Here we go. So this is the layout of the Haven Hotel and you can see this jaggedy red line going around here. And these are the trees to be demolished. And there are two tree trunks here and here. So those are the ones that are to be removed, not demolished, <laughs> to be taken down. And there is one little tree right here uh, which is to be removed. Now, I we were stood here and I can't recall seeing that tree there, but wh whichever tree it is, it was small or is small. And, um, and your tree officer has advised right from the beginning that 
these two trees are um, unstable. They're a forked tree and they are uh, then they're not in good health. Uh, and, and it's perfectly reasonable to remove those. And this one is obviously very small. Um, so the replacement trees for these two at the front will be planted here between blocks B and C. Um, so hopefully that answers that. And then there are further re tree planting in the. So that would compensate for the loss of that one. Thank you, Claire. Councillor Hilliard, please. Thank you. Uh, obviously, because of a huge number of objectors, I, I think it was probably right that these applications have come to committee. But if it wasn't for the uh, 30 odd uh, uh, approve, uh, positive for the planning, it wouldn't have come to committee. It would have just been an officer decision due to flood risk. So I, I echo the flood, uh, the officer's decision and say that we should refuse, propose that we refuse on flood risk. And if I can just clarify that if, if we refuse the 106 falls away, so other uh, reason for a refusal about scale and mass and particular the haven would would it come appropriate they would be listed as well is that right Claire? um yeah so the the uh, we wouldn't start writing reasons for refusal on on um the the extra story height and all the rest but what you have is is reason number four on your agenda uh at the last page of the report uh 92 and and um it's because in the absence of a planning obligation um we have to say all of the th harms that are that are needing to be um re refused because we don't have a se section 106 so that all those negotiations haven't fallen away in the sense that should uh the applicant provide a section 106 agreement uh, at an appeal situation, for example, and all those matters were addressed in it, then that that would then fall away uh, if if it were approved. But the um, but because we can't secure them because there is no section one hundred six agreement, we've cited what those harms are: that the harm of not having affordable housing, not the heightened scale, uh, the the un the harm to not mitigating Dorset Heathland and Sandbanks Headland and um, the uh, the Heathland Warden, the £30,000 a year for the Heathland Warden to be based in the flats at the Haven Hotel and to um, offer advice to, um, to those going on the ferry about the Studland and also the harbour in winter months about the bird life. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you. Thank you, members. Councillor Hilliard has proposed that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Do we have anyone wishing to speak? I, before we do, I, I just I just need to say a couple of things. The majority of this debate has been around the Haven Hotel. We seem to have failed to talk anything about the Sandbanks Hotel and the Harbour Height Hotel, which, as a planning board, I think is very remiss of us. We need to discuss the whole application, not just one part of it. So I would ask members before we go to any move to think seriously about that and bring up any comments they have about the other two parts as well. Councillor O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still pondering where I, where I, I sit on this. I mean, I, ideally, I'd like to see the replacement of the hotel with a hotel, uh, but fundamentally, we have to uh, deal with the application that's in front of us, uh, and the application is for apartments. I suppose an observation I'd make is we're looking at three hotels, uh, all for different reasons, in my own opinion, are past their maximum commercial benefit. And, it, and it's long overdue that this area of pool should trade up to a deserving standard. In fact, PP23 does permit that to happen. Uh, and I would ask, how many times have you stayed in a British hotel to compare them with one that you might stay with in London? Uh, where there's mega money in hotels, or compare it with one you might have stayed uh, with or in at a, uh, abroad. Um, and what, and I must be honest, I do like the design of these hotels. I actually think it adds a positive kudos 
to what Sang Banks should be. Uh, and we have to look forward at where tourism is going and what it's going to be in the future. And I, I do, you know, I do, I do have a dilemma here. Um, so that's all I'd say at this stage, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neil. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, your comments just there. It's almost like you've been reading the notes I've been scribbling down for the last uh, however many hours we've been doing this now. Uh, so to, to run through the sites um, in order, and again, like Councillor Neil, I find myself very much torn on this, and I'll say this uh, straight up, if the flood risk wasn't there, having heard what I've heard, I'd be absolutely for approval of this of this scheme. So just to run through the three, the Harbour Heights, quite clearly to me, the, the proposed development will be approval in the style, the look, and the offer that that particular hotel would bring to the to the local community. The, the style fits in a lot better with what we now have in the area. You've got a lot more modern buildings going in there. You only have to look down the hill. And since the plans that we have been shown um, came to us, there have been modern new homes developed at the bottom of that very hill there. They stepped away, uh, uh, it stepped away and aligned sufficiently well in my mind to negate any harmful overlooking given the uh, the way all the buildings are aligned facing towards the harbour. Um, the improval of the tourism offer there, I don't think we can we can argue that the improval in the quality of, of the hotel will be a big, big plus. And also the uh, the, the highways improvements will also be massive given the, uh, the relocation of the parking to underfloor, the removal of the ad hoc access from uh, Chasley Glen, Glen Road. Uh, and also, obviously, then you have the biodiversity benefits of restoring a lot of hard standing to, to green areas and green space and the seed and roofs as well. So it, you know, the, the Harbour Heights one, I have absolutely no objection to whatsoever. Moving on to the, the Sandbanks Hotel, obviously the, the flood risk I'll come on to uh, in a minute when we're going to talk about uh, it as a whole. Um, but again, the style, the design, the quality are a marked improvement on what's there now. Whilst I'm sure when it was built, it was quite an attractive and quite a prominent building on that section of land. What it is now is, in my personal opinion, and to be rather blunt, is a bit of a higgledy-piggledy mishmash of styles given several different uh, redevelopments and, and, uh, and additions to it. And now you can't really tell that it's, that it's one hotel unless you're standing at the, um, at the back. And the improvement of this into what is, in my opinion, a very high quality design, very modern, very forward thinking. It will not look out of date for, I would think, many decades. And that's exactly what you want to plan for. You want to build something that is going to stand out and remain that high quality for a great period of time. The modern design is echoed along Sandbanks more and more, when, whether you're talking about uh, the block literally right next to the Sandbanks site, or as you move around, uh, around Panorama Road and, and Banks Road, you have a vast majority now of the new developments are coming in with a much more contemporary style and a mix of contemporary styles at that. And having something in this prominent location that allied with that is, I think, something that we absolutely should not turn down just because it's so different to what is, what is there. It's different to what is there. It's an improvement on what is there massively. And doubling in size, the, the, the improvement to efficiency of that site are you know, you cannot argue with that. It's more than doubling the amount of, of rooms. It's massively improving the quality of, uh, of hospitality that that site can offer. It's improving the amenity of the site in removing all that hard standing from the front of it. As you're coming around that panorama, all you can see in that site is just a ton of hard standing, a lot of car parking. We're not removing the car parking. We're moving it to a different and more efficient location, in my opinion, underground. So... And the codification of the footpath is a massive public benefit. Everyone who's walked on there knows that sometimes you can walk down there and you walk down and the, the gate is, is locked because it's not a, a codified public right of way. It's not maintained as such. And, it, and with this application, it absolutely, it absolutely will be. And that is a benefit that cannot be, cannot be overlooked. Now, of course, we move on to the Haven Hotel. The building is not to my personal taste but then that's not at all what uh, what matters but what cannot be argued is that it is crumbling quite frankly and when you look at, at redevelopments and uh, the empire state building was was mentioned that makes quite a bit more money 
and it's quite a bit more sustainable than the Haven Hotel is because it's slap bang in the middle of one of the biggest cities in the world and is one of the most famous landmarks in the world. Now, this is very, very famous and very, very dear to, to us as a conurbation, but we can't lie and look at the money and say that we could just keep it going and keep it commercially viable. You know, it is falling down. We saw that in the site visit yesterday, the amount of damage that, that, is, that is there. And it won't be very long before that building becomes unsafe to be used as a, as a hotel or as anything. And at that point, what we don't want is the building laying derelict on our, you know, in one of the most prominent locations in our conurbation. Now, that's not to say that it shouldn't be redeveloped as a hotel. Quite frankly, I'd like to see it redeveloped as a hotel. But as a member of the planning committee, I can't sit here and tell applicants what I want them to do with with the site. I can only deal with the application that's that's in front of me, as we all as we all must. And overall, given the fact we're only losing about 20, I think it is 20 hotel rooms across the three sites, I don't think there's enough there to justify myself having a personal objection to this just based on the loss and the changing of use of that particular site. I don't want it, but I think I have to deal with what's with what's in front of me. So overall, I can totally understand the the strength of the objections, not least if this was coming just as the Haven Hotel, I'm sure the strength would not diminish much. But the shock of three redevelopments for three quite well known sites, I'm sure, has amplified the feeling and, and quite understandably. But then moving on, as we have to do to to the flood risk. The it's a very it's a very tricky thing, because what it has to be remembered is that the environmental agency have not said that the majority of these flood defences are inadequate. It's that they have said that without the modelling, they don't know whether they are adequate or inadequate. Personally, I have some very uh, confusing thoughts about why they've said that the hydraulic solution seems uh, totally uh, unacceptable because the Thames flood barrier, for one, one of the most famous flood defences in the world, is an entirely hydraulic system. But that's uh, that's that's by the by. Um, the Section 106 agreement, I find a little... Um, unjust to hold that against the applicant as a reason for refusal, given that because it's been recommended for refusal, we haven't offered them one. So I can't, you know, but that's again, that's a, a little bit further down the line. So I don't know whether I'll be supporting the move at this at this time, because without that flood, um, that flood risk, you know, if I knew that those um, flood defences were adequate by the EA standards, I would have very little hesitation in granting this granting these applications or this application i should say but with with that flood risk i you know i do not know where i'll support the move to go with the officer's recommendation as yet because i think the public benefits are so massive that amount of money going through sill going to affordable housing is is something we cannot we cannot sneer at the codification of that public uh, that public right of way the improvement of our tourism offer the benefits that that will bring to us I do not know whether I can support the officer of recommendation as yet. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Borsett. Is this affordable housing too expensive for this area? With property prices changing, or is it too selective? I support um, affordable homes. The affordable housing is a contribution which will be spent around the conurbation, not necessarily in that area. So therefore, that amount of money would certainly be making it affordable for other people. So we could get bargain houses somewhere yep. down the road. Yeah. I recommend Fruit and Musk if I do. <laughs> Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, like the Vice Chair, I think I'll just sort of run through a bit of a summary of my thoughts on, on this whole um, proposal. Um, I do welcome the planning officer's work with, and the applicant's work to revise the designs because I think the original designs were just way out of kilter and to sort of minimise, re reduce the, the heights and that those designs was to be much more in line with planning policy is really welcome. So I'm grateful for that work over the years. I welcome the representations from the residents and the Sandbanks Neighbourhood Forum and other interested groups and the ward councillors because that's very useful for us to sort of inform our judgments. The site visit yesterday was really useful. I've always found site visits very informative that you can sort of see and hear and experience things which you can't just get from a, from a uh, written report on a screen. And the case officer's presentation was really good. 
I sat on Paul's planning committee for some years and regularly went to site visits on the Sandbanks Peninsula to developments within that area. And it's, it's, it is really good to see proposals for these key sites coming forward to continue the whole renewal of the Sandbanks Peninsula, which has been happening over the last couple of decades. Um, firstly, Harbour Heights Hotel, quite like the vice chair, actually. I don't I don't have an issue with that. I welcome that. It fits within the woodland setting. It sits well alongside the neighbouring properties. The proposals for the conference facilities and the terrace at, at the top are, are very welcome. It does resolve some local issues, um, especially in relation to Chattersley Get Glen and the access from there. Um, it's a significant development in the locality in that local area has been ongoing, particularly Chattersley Glen for a while. Um, so I think it's sort of in keeping with that. The underground car park, I think, improves the outside appearance by removing some of the surface car parking. And I, I, I welcome renewal of that site and, and keeping it as an important tourist facility for the town. Similarly, the Sandbanks Hotel, um, I'm glad the scale has been reduced from those early designs. Um, it's now much more appropriate and acceptable. Um, the increased level of hotel rooms on that site is very welcome particularly, as was mentioned, the new public right of way is really good and does benefit both residents and visitors. And I've had comments from people who sort of park along Shore Road and have to go around the long way. Um, so I think that's a really useful benefit, which will, you know, last for, forever. Um, the design and appearance of the proposal on Sandbanks Hotel site is a vast improvement to what's there and improved landscaping in green space is really welcome. So I think that's entirely acceptable, that proposal. Obviously, then the key one, the Haven Hotel. I do welcome the public right of way enhancement along the front. There's a number of times I've gone along there and climbed up that little ladder. So I think that's a, that would be really welcome. The rear four story block of flats in place of the current business centre, I think block A, it was described as. I find that quite acceptable, you know, losing that business centre, you know, it's more appropriate for in other locations within the town rather than having business units on, on the Sandbanks Peninsula. So I find a sort of replacement of that with residential, to me, feels acceptable. But overall, 119 additional residential units across the Haven Hotel site, which as mentioned is mostly going to be luxury flats. That's not going to help our local housing situation or help deal with the sort of people that are you know, in need of local housing or affordable housing. So I really struggle a bit with losing that whole hotel site to residential use. Um, I'm concerned about the impact on trees and the Dorset AOMB, as I've mentioned. I don't really, to, to, to an extent, like the use of financial mitigation payments to overcome that. I don't think, you know, regardless of what money you pay and what other off-site moderations you make, you can't always deal with the direct impact on that site. So I, I'm definitely concerned about that. Um, like I said, I'm concerned about residential on that whole site and not really contributing to local housing need. I think potentially on that Haven Hotel, a mixed hotel and residential proposal on the Haven Hotel site would be more acceptable and would overcome my concerns. But I think in principle, residential across that whole site and loss of a hotel on that site, I would uh, I would be against this application on those grounds as well as the flood protection grounds. So. I'd be in favour of refusal on more than the flood protection grounds and other other grounds. I think the vice chair was talking a bit about losing the benefits. And I think it was made clear in the case of the presentation. It's not our role to balance, make a balanced judgment of the benefits of this overall scheme against the impacts and detriment. There is the flood protection issue is a is a red line issue, and then we don't have, so we don't need to be looking at balance against impacts. Um, but like I say beyond the flood protection issue, I've got other concerns that I would object to this proposal and would vote for refusal. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Barron. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, the, the officer stated that the abutting trees have only got a sort of 10 or 20 years life left in them. So I'm on this on the Haven next to the Haven. So you know I'm 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 looking looking at the application now, thinking well, in 10, 10 years time, twenty years time, it's not the the proposed won't be as screened as it is now, and any replacement trees will, could take fifty years to to reach that height. So I'm, I'm sort of consider, considering how how it looks and the impact of it because it's 
it's very easy to look at CGI's. We all know why why, why they're done. They, they make they make things look you know they're very rarely done to make things look horrible. Um, so you know they always sort of look, 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 looks quite attractive when when they're done sometimes. Um, so that, that that's a concern. Um, the suggestion that the, 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 yeah the flooding that the suggestion that residents in times of flooding will be sunbathing, looking for a glass screen, watching sea bass swim past. I, I don't I don't believe. Um, common sense tells me that no sheet of glass will hold back the English Channel. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Le Pen, please. Thank you. Unlike some of my colleagues, I haven't actually been writing any notes, so this is probably going to be a bit garbled and a bit nonsense in some cases. But I hope it won't be too um, unintelligible. Um, going through the three sites, the Harbour Heights site. I'm happy with. Um, I can't see any particular problems. Um, as, I, as I've indicated by my previous question, I, instinctively I would rather refurbish than demolish if it were feasible. But and, and I must admit, I do quite like quirky, haphazard buildings. <laughs> but there are limits, and and I think well, particularly actually, it's the Sandbanks one is is probably beyond the limit of, of quirky and, and haphazard. Um, again, the the Sandbanks Hotel again, um, a vast improvement. The footpath is a definite asset. Um, you can't have a footpath that's sometimes available and then sometimes not. You don't know where you are. Well, you don't know where you are. You're up against a locked gate that you can't get through it. Um, so I'm very happy to, to accept that. Um, it sounds as though the seawall there has been sorted out for the flooding risk, um, although I'm still a bit vague as to exactly how it's going to be. But I, I accept that, that, that the officer um, is happy with the arrangements. So as ever, it's back to the Haven Hotel. Um, I must admit, I haven't got the emotional uh, attachment to the Haven or to a hotel in, there at all. As far as I can remember, in all the time I've lived in Poole, I've been to the Haven once for a meal, and that was 15, 20 years ago for an event. So I, I have no personal experience of it worth speaking of. and. As I say, I have no at person, uh, emotional attachment or personal attachment. And um, the thing that struck me when we when we got the paperwork and the uh, plans and the pictures, the CGI's, that of course there is already a block of flats right next to it, which I must admit, in all my time in Paul, I hadn't really appreciated. I'd always thought that was part of the Haven Hotel. And it's not. It's a block of flats. There is already a a very bog standard 60s type square box block of flats um so precedent in that sense has been set i don't know what was there before because i wasn't around and no idea what i mean not here i might have been around at the time but not here i'm certainly not interested so um i i don't know you know whether it was a vacant site or what but that's not relevant to this case anyway but nevertheless flats on the on that peninsula there is a precedent um but, but, my, we're told that 119 flats is a bonus. And yes, if it's just a tick box exercise on what we should be providing in BCP, particularly in the pool part in housing, yes, it goes a noticeable way towards it. But as far as helping the housing situation, certainly locally, and I would, I would say probably even nationally, it doesn't go very far because I am sure most of those flats will be bought as second homes, as holiday homes. They will not be lived in year round. We, we, we asked the question about the existing block of flats yesterday, and I know it's hearsay and probably not scientifically accurate, but we were told that it was something like half and half occupied year round and half holiday or second homes or whatever. Um, I suspect these may be a high proportion of not lived in all year round. So it won't be local people downsizing for their retirement home. It won't be even people from other parts of the country downsizing for a retirement home. It will be 
extra accommodation, which, as I say, does not help the housing situation at all, uh, locally or nationally. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't see the housing as necessarily a, a bonus or an asset um, in this case. But then the big sticking point is the uh, flooding and the flood defences. And until that can be sorted out, I don't think we can support it. I'm sure the developer has heard our comments. He will know how we feel about the other elements of the development um, and how we feel uh, the various views on the Haven Hotel. So hopefully note will be taken and come forward um, it will have taken that into account and hopefully that the flooding can be sorted out with the environment agency and we can get some sort of solution um, because the whole thing is will, will be just lying fallow until the whole thing can be sorted um, because they've been put together um, so as you can gather I'm, I'm still a bit ambivalent um, before I finish I would though like to thank the case officer um, I think she's done a magnificent job in her presentation today in the site visit yesterday and it's so good to have someone doing the presentation who's clearly been involved with the scheme for a long time we've recently we seem to have had people who've come in at the last minute or maybe they're not even the case officer they're a, a senior officer who's just taking it on and and you you don't get the depth of knowledge and I really appreciate that so thank you Claire for your part in this. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor President. And I think um, all members echo your comments there with regards to Claire's work and the presentation she's given us today and yesterday on the site visit. She's done an amazing job. Councillor Rice. Um, yes, I have a list of comments as well. Um, with regards to highways, um, I disagree with the comments by Councillor Johnson. Um, I do not agree that this will be a huge improvement to highways. Um, everyone in this room will know that there is always an issue with congestion in this particular area of where these sites are, um, but indeed across the whole of BC. This application once again highlights the need to provide strategic alternative transportation options to everyone across the conurbation because it is providing similar or not more car parking to what is currently available. The expectation therefore is that there will be the same number if not more individual trips by car in the area therefore I do not see any particular improvement to highways. Personally I'm concerned by the cost of the underground parking stacking system. I would personally prefer for investment in public transport um, to withdraw the need for such expensive car stacking systems. If we then didn't need the expensive car uh, car parking, then perhaps those millions of pounds could go towards social housing and keep house prices lower. It is difficult because transportation by car is currently cheaper, safer and more convenient than any other form of transport. It is a bigger issue than this one application, but I do want to raise these points. I am not comfortable with the design of the buildings and would prefer to see more emphasis on energy use reduction through the building design. I can certainly reassure Councillor Barron um, that I am talking about best practice construction design in keeping with the climate emergency. This building, for example, I agree, is not comfortable due to lack of ventilation and how it was designed. I am very concerned about the lack of social housing or affordable housing contributions. I am concerned by the urban design officer's comments and resident comments about breaking the tree canopy line. I am very concerned about the flooding risks and what needs to be done designed given the ever increasing concerns about sea level rise. And also this relates to the expectation of uh, residents in the area that are increasingly concerned about sea level and so they should be. And fundamentally, I agree that this will do nothing to help the housing crisis that we have, exacerbating the issue that local people cannot afford to stay here as they grow up. Again, an issue that is bigger than this one application, but this application does not do as much as it could do. I feel that this particular site regarding the Haven Hotel should be reserved for public use rather than private and the benefit to society is far greater to keep it as a hotel than for a private company to gain financially and provide some exclusive flats that are not needed in a society that is struggling with extreme differences in wealth and poverty, particularly in our BCP area. Thank you. Councillor Rice, any other members wishing to speak before I move to a vote? Before I do so, Mr First, is there anything you would like to come in on? 
from a legal point of view? Uh, I don't think so, Chairman, at this moment. No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Claire, is there anything that you would like to come back on before we go to a vote? No, I, I feel that all of you. And Councillor Hilliard, as the mover of this, are you content to with which reasons for refusal you wish to use? Is it the entirety of the report or are there just certain sections of it? The, the entirety of the officer's refusals, yes. Thank you. Thank you. OK, before we go to a vote, I'm just going to say a couple of words. I think like my, my colleague to my right here, if it wasn't for the flooding issues, I would be granting this right now. I think it's a vast improvement on what we have there. I often come back from running around over on the Purbex, et cetera, and I look at the Haven when I come back across the Verity and I'm like, oh, another old building. To me, it has no merit whatsoever anymore. It's well past its sell by date and it does need replacing. I also think that a hotel were to go there, it would become a very expensive and almost exclusive hotel which is not really what we as BCP are about. We're supposed to be about inclusivity, not just providing a building for the very wealthy people to come and stay in. So therefore, you know, if we're going to have a hotel there, it needs to be one that is going to be affordable for everyone to use. And if that were the case, it would be a very low rate building, in my opinion, because the developers just would not be able to afford to build a hotel of that five, four star quality. I think the two previous hotels, the Sandbanks and the um, Harbour Heights, again, both in desperate need of replacement. And I think the style particularly of the Sandbanks Hotel would just blend in seamlessly along that road now. There are so many more modern buildings along there. And equally with the Harbour Heights Hotel, when you come around that road, it just looks like a mismatch of 60s square shaped buildings that you know were just put up in a hurry back in their day. However, Having said all that, we do have the environment in, um, assessment from the Environment Agency, and that is my only concern. I, I would like the applicant to have listened to what we've said today, and I think he will probably have got the impression that we are mostly in favour of the design, style, etc., of this development. But we do need to get the EA's agreement to this because without it, we are pretty scuppered into where we go and it also has a great bearing on any future developments that will come along in and around that area and it is only and solely for that reason that I will reluctantly have to support the move to refuse this. So I will go to members in turn. I will call each name if you can please indicate whether you are for or against. Councillor Barron. For or against refusal. Yep, thank you. Councillor Barron. For refusal. Councillor Borswick. Could you use your microphone, please, Councillor Borswick? Um, sorry, um, for. Thank you. Councillor Davies. For. Councillor Hall. For refusal. Councillor Hilliard. For. Councillor Lepedevin. For. And Councillor O'Neill. Uh, for, but only on the basis of the flood risk assessment. Thank you. Councillor Rice? Four. Uh, Councillor Johnson? Four. And as I have stated reluctantly, I am agreeing with the officer's recommendation on this one. Therefore, that Councillor is... Brown, sorry, sorry Councillor Brown, I do apologise. Your name was not on my list because you're down as a substitute. Councillor Brown? Thank you, Chair. Um, for refusal. Thank you. Therefore, that uh, application is refused unanimously. May I say a very big thank you to the members of the public for bearing with us this morning in a torturous warm room and for coming along and putting your views for. And I may also say a massive thank you to the applicants for their ability to allow us to view the sites yesterday. That was most grateful and thank you for coming on today. But my biggest thanks has to go to Claire and the planning team for the work they have done on this, for putting such a great report together to allow us to make this decision today. Thank you, Claire. You've done a really good job. Thank you. Members, that being the end of the meeting, I wish you all a good afternoon. Go and enjoy the sunshine and have a swim if you say. So.